The Pillars of Creation, The Sword of Truth, Book 7, by Terry Goodkind, read by Nick Sullivan. This book contains 557 pages, Chapter 1. Picking through the dead man's pockets, Jensen Daggett came across the last thing in the world she would ever have expected to find. Startled, she sat back on her heels. The raw breeze ruffled her hair as she stared wide-eyed at the words written in precise, blocky letters on the small square of paper. The paper had been folded in half, twice, carefully, so that the edges had been even. She blinked, half expecting the words to vanish, like some grim illusion. They remained solid and all too real. Foolish though she knew the thought was, she still felt as if the dead soldier might be watching her for any reaction. Showing none outwardly, anyway, she stole a look at his eyes. They were dull and filmy. She had heard people say of the deceased that they looked like they were only sleeping. He didn't. His eyes looked dead. His pale lips were taut. His face was waxy. There was a purplish blush at the back of his bull neck. Of course, he wasn't watching her. He was no longer watching anything. With his head turned to the side toward her, though, it almost seemed as if he might be looking at her. She could imagine he was. Up on the rocky hill behind her, bare branches clattered together in the wind like bones clacking. The paper in her trembling fingers seemed to be rattling with them. Her heart, already thumping at a brisk pace, started to pound harder. Jensen prided herself in her level-headedness. She knew she was letting her imagination get carried away. But she had never before seen a dead person, a person so grotesquely still. It was dreadful seeing someone who didn't breathe. She swallowed in an attempt to compose her own breathing, if not her nerves. Even if he was dead, Jensen didn't like him looking at her, so she stood, lifted the hem of her long skirts, and stepped around the body. She carefully folded the small piece of paper over twice, the way it had been folded when she had found it, and slipped it into her pocket. She would have to worry about that later. Jensen knew how her mother would react to those two words on the paper. Determined to be finished with her search, she squatted on the other side of the man. With his face turned away, it almost seemed as if he were looking back up at the trail from where he had fallen, as if he might be wondering what had happened and how he had come to be at the bottom of the steep, rocky gorge with his neck broken. His cloak had no pockets. Two pouches were secured to his belt. One pouch held oil, whetstones, and a strop. The other was packed with jerky. Neither contained a name. If he'd known better, as she did, he would have taken the long way along the bottom of the cliff rather than traverse the trail across the top, where patches of black ice made it treacherous this time of year. Even if he didn't want to retreat the way he had come in order to climb down into the gorge, it would have been wiser for him to have made his way through the woods, despite the thick bramble that made travel difficult up there among the deadfall. Done was done. If she could find something that would tell her who he was, maybe she could find his kin, or someone who knew him. They would want to know. She clung to the safety of the pretense. Almost against her will, Jensen returned to wondering what he had been doing out here. She feared that the carefully folded piece of paper told her only too clearly. Still, there could be some other reason, if she could just find it. She had to move his arm a little if she was to look in his other pocket. Dear spirits, forgive me, she whispered as she grasped the dead limb. His unbending arm moved only with difficulty. Jensen's nose wrinkled with disgust. He was as cold as the ground he lay on, as cold as the sporadic raindrops that fell from the iron sky. This time of year, it was almost always snow driven before such a stiff west wind. The unusual intermittent mist and drizzle had surely made the icy places on the trail at the top even slicker. The dead man only proved it. She knew that if she stayed much longer, she would be caught out in the approaching winter rain. She was well aware that people exposed to such weather risked their lives. Fortunately, Jensen wasn't terribly far from home. If she didn't get home soon, though, her mother, worried at what could be taking so long, would probably come out after her. Jensen didn't want her mother getting soaked, too. Her mother would be waiting for the fish Jensen had retrieved from baited lines in the lake. For once, the lines they tended through holes in the ice had brought them a full stringer. The fish were lying dead on the other side of the dead man, where she had dropped them after making her grim discovery. He hadn't been there earlier, or she would have seen him on her way out to the lake. Taking a deep breath to gird her resolve, Jensen made herself return to her search. 
she imagined that some woman was probably wondering about her big handsome soldier, worrying if he was safe, warm, and dry. He was none of that. Jensen would want someone to tell her mother if it were she who had fallen and broken her neck. Her mother would understand if she delayed a bit to try to find out the man's identity. Jensen reconsidered. Her mother might understand, but she still wouldn't want Jensen anywhere near one of these soldiers. But he was dead. He couldn't hurt anyone now, much less her and her mother. Her mother would be even more troubled once Jensen showed her what was written on the little piece of paper. Jensen knew that what really drove her search was the hope for some other explanation. She desperately wanted it to be something else. That frantic need kept her beside his dead body when she wanted nothing so much as to run for home. If she didn't find anything to explain away his presence, then it would be best to cover him and hope that no one ever found him. Even if she had to stay out in the rain, she should cover him over as quickly as possible. She shouldn't wait. Then no one would ever know where he was. She made herself push her hand down into his trouser pocket all the way to the end. The flesh of his thigh was stiff. Her fingers hurriedly gathered up the nest of small objects at the bottom. Gasping for breath at the awful task, she pulled it all out in her fist. She bent close in the gathering gloom and opened her fingers for a look. On top were a flint, bone buttons, a small ball of twine, and a folded handkerchief. With one finger, she pushed the twine and handkerchief to the side exposing a weighty clutch of coins, silver and gold. She let out a soft whistle at the sight of such wealth. She didn't think that soldiers were rich, but this man had five gold marks among a large number of silver marks, a fortune by most any standard. All the silver pennies, not copper, silver, seemed insignificant by contrast, even though they alone were probably more than she had spent in the whole of her twenty years. The thought occurred to her that it was the first time in her life that she had ever held gold, or even silver, marks. The thought occurred to her that it might be plunder. She found no trinket from a woman, as she had hoped, so as to soften her worry about what sort of man he had been. Regrettably, nothing in the pocket told her anything of who he might be. Her nose wrinkled as she went about the chore of returning his possessions to his pocket. Some of the silver pennies spilled from her fist. She picked them all up from the wet, frozen ground and forced her hand into his pocket again in order to return them all to their rightful place. His pack might tell her more, but he was sprawled atop it, and she wasn't sure she wanted to try to have a look, since it was likely to hold only supplies. His pockets would have held anything he considered valuable, like the piece of paper. She supposed all the evidence that she really needed was in plain sight. He wore stiff leather armor under his dark cloak and tunic, at his hip was a simple but ruggedly made and wickedly sharp soldier's sword in a torn, utilitarian black leather scabbard. The sword was broken at mid-length, no doubt in the long tumble from the trail. Her eyes glided more carefully over the remarkable knife sheathed at his belt. The hilt of the knife, gleaming in the gloom, was what had riveted her attention from the first instant. The sight of it had held her frozen until she realized its owner was dead. She was sure that no simple soldier would possess a knife that exquisitely crafted. It had to be more expensive than any knife she had ever seen. On the silver hilt was the ornate letter R. Even so, it was a thing of beauty. From a young age, her mother had taught her to use a knife. She wished her mother could have a knife as fine as this. Jensen. Jensen jumped at the whispered word. Not now. Dear spirits, not now. Not here. Jensen. Jensen was not a woman who hated much in life, but she hated the voice that sometimes came to her. She ignored it now, as always, forcing her fingers to move to try to discover if there was anything else about the man that she should know. She checked the leather straps for concealed pockets, but found none. The tunic was a plain cut, without pockets. Jensen, came the voice again. She gritted her teeth. Leave me be, she said aloud, if under her breath. Jensen. It sounded different this time, almost as if the voice wasn't in her head as it always was. Leave me alone, she growled. Surrender, came the dead murmur. She glanced up and saw the man's dead eyes staring at her. The first curtain of cold rain billowing in the wind felt like the icy fingers of spirits caressing her face. Her heart galloped yet faster. 
her breath caught against her ragged poles like silk catching on dry skin. With her wide-eyed gaze locked on the dead soldier's face, she pushed with her feet, scuttling back across the gravel. She was being silly. She knew she was. The man was dead. He wasn't looking at her. He couldn't be. His stare was fixed in death, that's all, like her stringer of dead fish. They weren't looking at anything. Neither was he. She was being silly. It only seemed he was looking at her. But even if the dead eyes were staring at nothing, she would just as soon that they weren't doing it in her direction. Jensen. Beyond, above the sharp rise of granite, the pine trees swayed from side to side in the wind, and the bare maple and oak waved their skeletal arms. But Jensen kept her gaze fixed on the dead man as she listened for the voice. The man's lips were still. She knew they would be. The voice was in her head. His face was still turned toward the trail from where he had fallen to his death. She had thought his lifeless sight had been turned in that direction too, but now his eyes seemed to be turned more toward her. Jensen curled her fingers around the hilt of her knife. Jensen, leave me be. I'll not surrender. She never knew what it was that the voice wanted her to surrender. Despite having been with her nearly her whole life, it had never said. She found refuge in that ambiguity. As if in answer to her thought, the voice came again. Surrender your flesh, Jensen. Jensen couldn't breathe. Surrender your will. She swallowed in terror. It had never said that before. Never said anything she could understand. Often she would faintly hear it as if it were too far away to be clearly understood. Sometimes she thought she could hear the words, but they seemed to be in a strange language. She often heard it when she was falling asleep, calling to her in that distant, dead whisper. It spoke other words to her, she knew, but never so as she could understand more than her name and that frighteningly seductive single-word command to surrender. That word was always more forceful than any other. She could always hear it, even when she could hear no other. Her mother said that the voice was the man who, nearly Jensen's whole life, had wanted to kill her. Her mother said that he wanted to torment her. Jen, her mother would often say, it's all right, I'm here with you. His voice can't hurt you. Not wanting to burden her mother, Jensen often didn't tell her about the voice. But even if the voice couldn't hurt her, the man could if he found her. At that moment, Jensen desperately wished for the protective comfort of her mother's arms. One day he would come for her. They both knew he would. Until then, he sent his voice. That's what her mother thought anyway. As much as that explanation frightened her, Jensen preferred it to thinking herself mad. If she didn't have her own mind, she had nothing. What's happened here? Jensen gasped in a cry of fright as she spun, pulling her knife. She dropped into a half-crouch, feet spread, knife held in a death grip. It was no disembodied voice, this. A man was walking up the gully toward her. With the wind in her ears and the distraction of the dead man and the voice, she hadn't heard him coming. As big as he was, as close as he was, she knew that if she ran, and if he was of a mind, he could easily run her down. Chapter 2 The man slowed when he saw her reaction and her knife. I didn't mean to give you a scare. His voice was pleasant enough. Well, you did. Although the hood of his cloak was up and she couldn't see his face clearly, he seemed to be taking in her red hair the way most people did when they saw her. I can see that. I apologize. She didn't slacken her defensive posture in acceptance of the apology, but instead swept her gaze to the sides, checking to see if he was alone, to see if anyone else was with him and might be sneaking up on her. She felt a fool for being caught by surprise like that. In the back of her mind, she knew she couldn't ever really be safe. It didn't necessarily take stealth. Even simple carelessness on her part could at any time bring the end. She felt a sense of forlorn doom at how easily it could happen. If this man could walk up in broad daylight and startle her so easily, what did that say of her hopelessly extravagant dream that one day her life could be her own? The dark rock wall of the cliff glistened in the wet. The windswept gully was deserted of anyone but her and the two men, the dead one and the one alive. Jensen was not given to imagining sinister faces lurking in forest shadows, as she had been as a child. The dark places in among the trees were empty. The man stopped a dozen paces away. 
By his posture, it wasn't fear of her knife that halted him, but fear of causing her a worse fright. He stared openly at her, seemingly lost in some private thought. He quickly recovered from whatever it was about her face that so held his gaze. I can understand why a woman would have cause to be frightened when a stranger suddenly walks up on her. I would have passed on by without alarming you, but I saw that fellow on the ground and you there bent over him. I thought you might need help, so I rushed over. The cold wind pressed his dark green cloak against his sinewy build and lifted the other side away to reveal his well-cut but simple clothes. His cloak's hood covered his head against the first trailers of rain, leaving his face somewhat indistinct in its shadow. His smile was one of courteous intent, no more. He wore the smile well. He's dead, was all she could think to say. Jensen was unaccustomed to speaking to strangers. She was unaccustomed to speaking to anyone but her mother. She was unsure as to what to say, how to react, especially under the circumstances. Oh, I'm sorry. He stretched his neck a little without coming any closer, trying to see the man on the ground. Jensen thought it a considerate thing to do, not trying to come closer to someone who was clearly nervous. She hated that she was so obvious. She had always hoped she might appear to others somewhat inscrutable. His gaze lifted from the dead man to her knife to her face. I suppose you had cause. Perplexed for a second, she finally grasped his meaning and blurted out, I didn't do it. He shrugged. Sorry, from over here I can't tell what happened. Jensen felt awkward holding a knife on the man. She lowered the arm with the weapon. I didn't mean to... to appear a madwoman. You just startled the wits out of me. His smile warmed. I understand. No harm done. So, what happened? Jensen gestured with her empty hand toward the cliff face. I think he fell from the trail up there. His neck's broken. At least I think it is. I only just discovered him. I don't see any other footprints. My guess is that he was killed in a fall. As Jensen returned her knife to its sheath on her belt, he considered the cliff. Glad I took the bottom rather than the trail up there. She inclined her head in invitation toward the dead man. I was looking for something that might tell me who he was. I thought maybe I should notify someone, but I haven't found anything. The man's boots crunched through the coarse gravel as he approached. He knelt on the other side of the body rather than beside her, perhaps to give the knife-wielding madwoman a precautionary bit of space so she would feel a little less jumpy. I'd guess you were right, he said, after taking in the abnormal cant of the head. Looks like he's been here at least part of the day. I was through here earlier. Those are my tracks there. I don't see any others about. She gestured toward her catch, lying just behind her. When I went to the lake to check my lines earlier, he wasn't here. He twisted his head in order to better study the still face. Any idea who he was? No, I don't have a clue, other than that he's a soldier. The man looked up. Any idea what kind of soldier? Jensen's brow drew tight. What kind? He's a Daharan soldier. She lowered herself to the ground in order to look at the stranger more directly. Where are you from that you wouldn't recognize a Daharan soldier? He ran his hand under his cloak's hood and rubbed it along the side of his neck. I'm just a traveler passing through. He looked as tired as he sounded. The answer perplexed her. I've moved around my whole life, and I don't know of anyone who wouldn't know a Daharan soldier when they saw one. How can you not? I'm new to Dahara. That's not possible. Dahara covers most of the world. This time, his smile betrayed amusement. Is that so? She could feel her face heat, and she knew it must be going red with how ignorant of the world at large she had shown herself to be. Well, doesn't it? He shook his head. No. I'm from far to the south, beyond the land that is Dahara. She stared in wonder, her chagrin evaporating in light of the implications that came into her head at such an astonishing notion. Perhaps her dream might not be so extravagant. And what are you doing here, in Dahara? I told you, traveling. He sounded weary. She knew how exhausting it could be to travel. His tone turned more serious. I know he's a Daharan soldier. You misunderstood me. What I meant was, what kind of soldier? A man belonging to a local regiment? A man stationed here? A soldier on his way home for a visit? A soldier going for a drink in town? A scout? Her sense of alarm rose. A scout? What would he be scouting for in his own homeland? The man looked off at the low, dark clouds. 
I don't know. I was only wondering if you knew anything of him. No, of course not. I just found him. Are these Daharan soldiers dangerous? I mean, do they bother folks? Folks just traveling through? Her gaze fled his questioning eyes. I... I don't know. I guess they could be. She feared to say too much, but she wouldn't want him to end up in trouble because she said too little. What do you suppose a lone soldier was doing way out here? Soldiers aren't often alone. I don't know. Why do you suppose a simple woman would know more about soldiering than a man of the world who travels about? Don't you have any ideas of your own? Maybe he was just on his way home for a visit or something. Maybe he was thinking about a girl back home, and so he wasn't paying attention like he should have been. Maybe that's why he slipped and fell. He rubbed his neck again, as if he were in pain. I'm sorry. I guess I'm not making much sense. I'm a little tired. Maybe I'm not thinking clearly. Maybe I was only concerned for you. For me? What do you mean? I mean that soldiers belong to units of one sort or another. Other soldiers know them and know where they're supposed to be. Soldiers don't just go off alone when they want to. They aren't like some lone trapper who could vanish and no one would know. Or some lone traveler? An easy grin softened his expression. Or some lone traveler. The grin withered. The point is, other soldiers will likely look for him. If they come upon his body here, they'll bring in troops to prevent anyone from leaving the area. Once they gather anyone they can find, they'll start asking questions. From what I've heard about Daharan soldiers, they know how to ask questions. They'll want to know every detail about every person they question. Jensen's middle cramped in sick, churning consternation. The last thing in the world she wanted was Daharan soldiers asking questions of her or her mother. This dead soldier could end up being the death of them. But what are the chances? I'm only saying that I'd not like to have this fellow's friends come along and decide that someone has to pay for his death. They might not see it as an accident. Soldiers get stirred up by the death of a comrade, even if it was an accident. You and I are the only two around. I'd not like to have a bunch of soldiers discover him and decide to blame us. You mean even if it was an accident, they might seize an innocent person and blame them for it? I don't know. But in my experience, that's the way soldiers are. When they're angry, they find someone to blame. But they can't blame us. You weren't even here, and I was only going to tend my fishing lines. He planted an elbow on his knee and leaned over the dead man toward her. And this soldier, going about his business for the great Daharan Empire, saw a beautiful young woman strutting along and was so distracted by her that he slipped and fell. I wasn't strutting. I don't mean to suggest you were. I only meant to show you how people can find blame when they decide they want to. She'd not thought of that. They were Daharan soldiers. Such behavior would hardly be out of the question. The rest of what he'd said registered in her mind. Jensen had never before had a man call her beautiful. It flustered her, coming so unexpectedly and out of place as it did in the middle of such a worry. Since she didn't have any idea how to react to the compliment, and since there were so many more important thoughts commanding her emotions, she ignored it. If they find him, the man said, then at the least they're going to collect anyone around and question them long and hard. All the ugly implications were becoming all too real. The day of doom was suddenly looming near. What do you think we should do? He thought it over a moment. Well, if they do come by, but don't find him, then they won't have any reason to stop and question the people here. If they don't find him, they'll go somewhere else to keep looking for him. He rose and looked around. Ground's too hard to dig a grave. He pulled his hood farther forward to shield his eyes from the mist as he searched. He pointed to a spot near the base of the cliff. There. There's a deep cleft that looks big enough. We could put him in there and cover him over with gravel and rocks. Best burial we can manage this time of year. And probably more than he deserved. She would just as soon leave him, but that wouldn't be wise. Covering him up was what she had planned on doing before the stranger happened along. This would be a better way to do it. There would be less chance that animals would uncover him for passing soldiers to discover. Seeing her trying to hastily weigh the various ramifications and mistaking it for reluctance, he spoke in soft assurance. The man is dead. Nothing can be done about it. It was an accident. Why let that accident bring trouble? We didn't do anything wrong. We weren't even here when it happened. I say we bury him and go on with our lives, without Daharan soldiers becoming unjustly involved. Jensen stood. 
The man might be right about soldiers coming upon a dead friend and deciding to question people. There was abundant reason to be worried about the dead Daharan soldier without this new concern. She thought again about the piece of paper she'd found in his pocket. That would be reason enough without any other. If the piece of paper was what she thought it might be, then questioning would only be the beginning of the ordeal. Agreed, she said. If we're to do it, let's be quick. He smiled, more relief than anything, she thought. Then, turning to face her more squarely, he pushed his hood back off his head, the way men did out of respect for a woman. Jensen was shocked to see, even though he was at most only six or seven years older than she, that his cropped hair was as white as snow. She gazed at it with much the same sense of wonder as people gazed at her red hair. With the shadows of the hood gone, she saw that his eyes were as blue as hers, as blue as people said her father's had been. The combination of this short white hair and those blue eyes was arresting. The way they both went with his clean-shaven face was singularly appealing. It all fit together with his features in a way that seemed completely right. He held his hand out across the dead soldier. My name is Sebastian. She hesitated a moment, but then offered her hand in return. Even though his was big and no doubt powerful, he didn't squeeze her hand to prove it, the way some men did. The unnatural warmth of the hand surprised her. Are you going to tell me your name? I'm Jensen Daggett. Jensen. He smiled his pleasure at the sound of it. She felt her face going red again. Instead of noticing, he immediately set to the task by grabbing the soldier under his arms and giving him a tug. The body moved only a short distance with each mighty pull. The soldier had been a huge man. Now he was a huge dead weight. Jensen seized the soldier's cloak at the shoulder to help. Sebastian moved his hold to the cloak at the other shoulder, and together they dragged the weight of the man, who loomed as dangerous to her in death as he would have in life across the gravel and slick patches of smooth rock. Still panting from the effort, and before pushing the soldier into the crevice that was to be his final resting place, Sebastian rolled him over. Jensen saw for the first time that he wore a short sword strapped over his shoulder under his pack. She hadn't seen it before because he was lying on it. Hooked on the weapon's belt around his waist at the small of his back hung a crescent-bladed battle axe. Jensen's level of apprehension rose at seeing how heavily armed the soldier had been. Regular soldiers didn't carry this many weapons, or a knife like he had. Sebastian tugged the straps of the pack down off the arms. He unstrapped the short sword and set it aside. He pulled off the weapon's belt and tossed it atop the sword. Nothing too unusual in the pack, he said after a brief inspection. He added the pack to the short sword, the weapon's belt, and the axe. Sebastian started searching the dead man's pockets. Jensen was about to question what he was doing when she recalled that she had done the same. She was somewhat more disturbed when he returned the other items after picking out the money. She thought it rather cold-blooded, stealing from the dead. Sebastian held the money out to her. What are you doing, she asked. Take it. He offered the money again, more insistently this time. What good is it going to do in the ground? Money is of use to relieve the suffering of the living, not the dead. You think the good spirits will ask him for the price of a bright and pleasant eternity? He was a Daharan soldier. Jensen expected the keeper of the underworld would have something somewhat more dark in store for this man's eternity. But it's not mine. He frowned a reproving look. Consider it partial compensation for all you've suffered. She felt her flesh go cold. How could he know? They were always so careful. What do you mean? The year is taken off your life by the fright this fellow gave you today. Jensen finally was able to let her breath go in a silent sigh. She had to stop fearing the worst in what people said. She allowed Sebastian to put the coins in her hand. All right, but I think you should have half for helping me. She handed three gold marks back. He grasped her hand with his other and pressed all three coins into her palm. Take it, it's yours now. Jensen thought of what this much money could mean. She nodded. My mother has had a hard life. She could use it. I will give it to my mother. I hope it helps you both, then. Let it be this man's last good act, helping you and your mother. Your hands are warm. By the look in his eyes, she thought she knew why. She said no more. He nodded and confirmed her suspicion. I've got a touch of fever. I came down with it this morning. When we get finished with this business, I'm hoping to get to the next town and rest up in a dry room for a while. I just need some rest to regain my strength. 
town is too far for you to make today. You sure? I can make good time. I'm used to traveling. So am I, Jensen said, and it takes me most of the day to make it. There's only a couple of hours of light left, and we have yet to finish with this task. Not even a fast horse would get you near town today. Sebastian let out a sigh. Well, I guess I'll make do. He knelt again and rolled the soldier part way over in order to unstrap the knife. The sheath, fine grain black leather, was trimmed with silver to match the handle and decorated with the same ornate emblem. On one knee, Sebastian held the gleaming sheathed knife up to her. Silly to bury such a fine weapon. Here you go. Better than that piece of junk you showed me before. Jensen stood stunned and confused. But you should keep it. I'll take the others. More to my taste, anyway. The knife is yours. Sebastian's rule. Sebastian's rule? Beauty belongs with beauty. Jensen blushed at the intended compliment. But this was not a thing of beauty. He had no idea of the ugliness this represented. Any idea what the R in the hilt stands for? Oh, yes, she wanted to say. She knew only too well what it represented. That was the ugliness. It stands for the House of Rall. House of Rall? Lord Rall, the ruler of the Hara, she said, in simple explanation of a nightmare. Chapter 3 by the time they were finished with the laborious task of covering the troublesome body of the dead Daharan soldier, Jensen's arms were weak with fatigue. The damp wind scything through her clothes felt like it cut to the bone. Her ears and nose and fingers were numb. Sebastian's face was covered in a sheen of sweat. But the dead man was at last buried under gravel and then rocks that were in abundance at the base of the cliff. Animals were not likely to be able to dig through all the heavy stone to get at the body. The worms would feast undisturbed. Sebastian had said a few simple words, asking the Creator to welcome the man's soul into eternity. He made no plea for mercy in his judgment, and neither did Jensen. As she finished scattering gravel with a heavy branch and her feet, obscuring the marks left by their work, she gave the area a critical examination and was relieved to see that no one would ever suspect that a person lay buried there. If soldiers came through, they wouldn't realize that one of their own had met his end here. They would have no reason to question local people, except perhaps to ask if anyone had seen him. That would be a simple enough lie to feed them, and one easily swallowed. Jensen pressed her hand against Sebastian's forehead. It confirmed her fears. You're burning with fever. We're done now. I can rest more easily, not having to worry that soldiers will be rousting me out of my bedroll to ask me questions at the point of a sword. She wondered where he was going to sleep. The drizzle was thickening. She expected it would soon be raining. Given the persistence of the darkening clouds, once it started, it would likely rain the whole night. Cold rain soaking him to the skin would only further inflame his fever. Such a winter rain could easily kill someone who lacked proper shelter. She watched as Sebastian strapped the weapons belt around his waist. He didn't place the axe at the small of his back the way the soldier had worn it, but rather positioned it at his right hip. After testing its edge and finding it satisfactory, he fastened the short sword to the left side of the belt. Both weapons were placed so as to come readily to hand. When he'd finished, he flipped his heavy green cloak closed over it all. He seemed again a simple traveler. She suspected he was more. He had his secrets. He wore them casually, almost in the open. She wore hers uneasily and held close. He handled the sword with the kind of smooth ease that came only with long acquaintance. She knew because she handled a knife with effortless grace, and such proficiency had come only with experience and continual practice. Some mothers taught their daughters to sew and cook. Jensen's mother didn't think sewing would save her daughter. Not that a knife would either, but it was better protection than needle and thread. Sebastian lifted the dead man's pack and threw back the flap. We'll divide the supplies. Do you want the pack? You should keep the supplies in the pack, Jensen said, as she retrieved her stringer of fish. He agreed with a nod. He appraised the sky as he cinched the pack closed. I'd best be on my way then. Where? His weary eyelids blinked at the question. No place special, traveling. I guess I'll walk for a while, and then I suppose I'd better try to find some shelter. Rain is coming, she said. It doesn't take a profit to tell that. He smiled. Guess not. His eyes bore the prospect of what lay ahead with resigned acceptance. 
He swiped his hand back over his wet spikes of white hair, then pulled up his hood. Well, take care of yourself, Jensen Daggett. Give my best to your mother. She raised a lovely daughter. Jensen smiled and acknowledged his words with a single nod. She stood, facing the damp wind as she watched him turn and start off across the flat expanse of gravel. Craggy rock walls rose up all around, their snow-crusted boulders disappearing into the low gray overcast that concealed the bulk of the mountains and the nearly endless range of high peaks. It seemed so funny, so freakish, so futile, that in all this vast country their paths should cross so briefly at that instant in time for such a tragic moment as one life ended, and then that they would both go off again into that infinite oblivion of life. Jensen's heart pounded in her ears as she listened to his footsteps crunching across the jagged gravel, watched his long strides carrying him away. With a sense of urgency, she debated what she should do. Was she always to turn away from people? To hide? Was she always to forfeit even small snatches of what it was to live life because of a crime she did not commit? Dare she risk this? She knew what her mother would say. But her mother loved her dearly, and so would not say it out of cruelty. Sebastian? He looked back over his shoulder, waiting for her to speak. If you don't have shelter, you may not live to see tomorrow. I wouldn't like it if I knew you were out here with a fever getting soaked to the skin. He stood watching her, the drizzle drifting between them. I wouldn't like that either. I'll mind your words and do my best to find some shelter. Before he could turn away again, she lifted her hand, gesturing off in the other direction. She saw that her fingers were trembling. You could come home with me. Would your mother mind? Her mother would be in a panic. Her mother would never allow a stranger, despite what help he had been, to sleep in the house. Her mother wouldn't sleep a wink all night with a stranger anywhere near. But if Sebastian stayed out with a fever, he could die. Jensen's mother would not wish that on this man. Her mother had a kind heart. That loving concern, not malice, was the reason she was so protective of Jensen. The house is small, but there's room in the cave where we keep the animals. If you wouldn't mind, you could sleep there. It's not as bad as it sounds. I've slept there myself on occasion when the house felt too confining. I'd make you a fire near the entrance. You'd be warm and could get the rest you need. He looked reluctant. Jensen held up her stringer of fish. We could feed you, she said, sweetening the offer. You would at least have a good meal along with a warm rest. I think you need both. You helped me. Let me help you. His smile one of gratitude, return. You're a kind woman, Jensen. If your mother will allow it, I will accept your offer. She lifted her cloak open, displaying the fine knife in its sheath, which she had tucked behind her belt. We'll offer her the knife. She will value it. His smile, warm and suddenly light-hearted with amusement, was as pleasant a smile as Jensen had ever seen. I don't think two knife-wielding women need lose any sleep over a stranger with a fever. That was Jensen's thought but she didn't admit it. She hoped her mother would see it that way, too. It's settled, then. Come along before the rain catches us out. Sebastian trotted to catch up with her as she started out. She lifted the pack from his hand and shouldered it. With his own pack and his new weapons, he had enough to carry in his weakened condition. Chapter 4 Wait here, Jensen said in a low voice. I'll go tell her that we have a guest. Sebastian dropped heavily onto a low projection of rock that made a convenient seat. You just tell her what I said, that I'll understand if she doesn't want a stranger spending the night at your place. I know it wouldn't be an unreasonable fear. Jensen considered him with a calm and somber demeanor. My mother and I have reason not to fear a visitor. She was not alluding to common weapons, and by her tone he knew it. For the first time since she had met him, she saw a spark of uncertainty in Sebastian's steady blue eyes, a shadow of uneasiness not elicited by her expertise with a knife. A hint of a smile came and turned to Jensen's lips as she watched him considering what manner of dark danger she might represent. Don't worry, only those bringing trouble would have cause to fear being here. He lifted his hands in a gesture of surrender. Then I'm as safe as a babe in his mother's arms. Jensen left Sebastian to wait on the rock while she made her way up the winding path through sheltering spruce, using twisted roots as steps up toward her house set back in a clutch of oak on a small shelf in the side of a mountain. 
The flat patch of grassy ground was, on a better day, a sunny open spot among the towering old trees. There was room enough to yard their goat along with some ducks and chickens. Steep rock to the back prevented any visitors happening upon them from that direction. Only the path up the front provided an approach. Should they be threatened, Jensen and her mother had constructed a well-hidden set of footholds up the back to a narrow ledge and out a twisting sideway via deer paths that would take them through a ravine and away. The escape route was nearly inaccessible as a way in unless you knew the precise course through the maze of rock walls, fissures, and narrow ledges, and even then they had made certain that key passages were well hidden by strategically placing dead wood and brush they'd planted. Ever since Jensen was young, they had moved often, never staying in one place too long. Here, though, where they felt safe, they had stayed for over two years. Travelers had never discovered their mountain hideaway, as sometimes had happened in other places they had stayed, and the people in Briarton, the nearest town, never ventured this far into such a dark and forbidding wood. The seldom-used trail around the lake, from where the soldier had fallen, was as close as any trail came to them. Jensen and her mother had gone into Briarton only once. It was unlikely that anyone even knew they were living out in the vast trackless mountains far from any farmland or city. Except for the chance encounter with Sebastian down closer to the lake, they'd never seen anyone near their place. This was the most secure spot she and her mother had ever had, and so Jensen had dared to begin to think of it as home. Since she was six, Jensen had been hunted. As careful as her mother always was, several times they had come frighteningly close to being snared. He was no ordinary man, the one who hunted her. He was not bound by ordinary means of searching. For all Jensen knew, the owl watching her from a high limb as she made her way up the rocky path could be his eyes watching her. Just as Jensen reached the house, she met her mother, throwing her cloak around her shoulders as she came out the door. She was the same height as Jensen, with the same thick hair to just past her shoulders, but more auburn than red. She was not yet thirty-five, and the prettiest woman Jensen had ever seen, with a figure the creator himself would marvel at. In different circumstances, her mother's life would have been one of countless suitors, some no doubt willing to offer a king's ransom for her hand. Her mother's heart, though, was as loving and beautiful as her face, and she had given up everything to protect her daughter. When Jensen sometimes felt sorry for herself, for the normal things in life that she couldn't have, she would then think of her mother, who had willingly given up all those same things, and more, for the sake of her daughter. Her mother was as close as it came to a guardian spirit in the flesh. Jensen! Her mother rushed to her and seized her shoulders. Oh, Jen, I was starting to worry so. Where have you been? I was just coming to look for you. I thought you must have had some trouble, and I was... I did, mother, Jensen confided. Her mother paused only momentarily. Then, without further question, she embraced Jensen in protective arms. After such a frightening day, Jensen openly welcomed the bomb of her mother's hug. Finally, with a comforting arm encircling Jensen's shoulders, her mother urged her toward the door. Come inside and get yourself dry. I see you have quite the catch. We'll have a good dinner, and you can tell me... Jensen was dragging her feet. Mother, I have someone with me. Her mother halted suddenly searching her daughter's face for any outward sign of the nature and depth of the trouble. What do you mean? Who would you have with you? Jensen flicked a hand back toward the path. He's waiting down there. I told him to wait. I told him I'd ask you if he could sleep in the cave with the animals. What? Stay here? Jen, what are you thinking? We can't... Mother, please listen to me. Something terrible happened today. Sebastian. Sebastian! Jensen nodded. The man I brought with me. Sebastian helped me. I came across a soldier who fell from the path, the high trail around the lake. Her mother's face went ashen. She said nothing. Jensen took a calming breath and started again. I found a Daharan soldier dead in the gorge below the high trail. There were no other tracks. I looked. He was an extraordinarily big soldier, and he was heavily armed. Battle axe, sword at his hip, sword strapped over his shoulder. Her mother canted her head with an admonishing expression. What aren't you telling me, Jen? Jen wanted to hold it back until she explained Sebastian first, but her mother could read it in her eyes, hear it in her voice. The terrible threat of that piece of paper with the two words on it seemed almost to be screaming its presence from her pocket. Mother, please, let me tell it my way. Her mother cupped a hand at the side of Jensen's face. 
Tell me, then, your way if you must. I was searching the soldier, looking for anything important, and I found something. But then, this man, a traveler, came upon me. I'm sorry, Mother, I was frightened by the soldier being there, and by what I found, and I wasn't paying attention as I should have. I know I behaved foolishly. Her mother smiled. No, baby, we all have lapses. None of us can be perfect. We all sometimes make mistakes. That doesn't make you foolish. Don't say that about yourself. Well, I felt foolish when he said something and I turned around and there he was. I had my knife out, though. Her mother was nodding with a smile of approval. He saw then that the man had fallen to his death. He, Sebastian, that's his name, he said that if we just left him there, then more likely than not other soldiers would find him and start questioning us all and maybe blame us for their fellow soldier being dead. This man, Sebastian, sounds like he knows what he's talking about. I thought so, too. I had intended to cover the dead soldier to try to hide him, but he was big. I could never have dragged him over to a cranny by myself. Sebastian offered to help me bury the body. Together we were able to drag him over and roll him into a deep split in the rock. We covered him over good. Sebastian put some heavy rocks atop the gravel I scooped in. No one will find him. Her mother looked more relieved. That was wise. Before we buried him, Sebastian thought we should take anything valuable rather than let it go to waste in the ground. One eyebrow arched. Did he now? Jensen nodded. She pulled the money from her pocket, the pocket that didn't have the piece of paper in it. She dumped all the money in her mother's hand. Sebastian insisted that I take it all. There's gold marks there. He didn't want any for himself. Her mother took in the fortune in her hand, then glanced briefly to the trail where Sebastian waited. She leaned closer. Jen, if he came with you, then perhaps he thinks he can have the money back at any time of his choosing. That would give him the opportunity to look generous and win your trust, and still be near enough to end up with the money when he chooses. I considered that, too. Her mother's tone softened sympathetically. Jen, it's not your fault. I've kept you so sheltered. But you just don't know how men can be. Jensen let her gaze drop from her mother's knowing eyes. I suppose it could be true, but I don't think so. And why not? Jensen looked back up more intently this time. He has a fever, mother. He's not well. He was leaving without asking to come with me at all. He bid me a goodbye. As tired and feverish as he is, I feared he'd die out in the rain tonight. I stopped him, told him that if it was all right with you, he could sleep in the cave with the animals where he could at least be dry and warm. After a moment of silence, Jensen added, He said that if you don't want a stranger near, he will understand and be on his way. Did he? Well, Jen, this man is either very honest or very clever. She fixed Jensen with an intent look. Which do you think it is, hmm? Jensen twined her fingers together. I don't know, Mother. I honestly don't. I wondered the same things as you. I really did. She remembered then. He said that he wanted you to have this, so you wouldn't have to fear a stranger sleeping nearby. Jensen drew the knife in its sheath from behind her belt and held it out to her mother. The silver handle gleamed in the dim yellow light coming from the small window behind her mother. Staring in astonishment, her mother slowly lifted the weapon in both hands as she whispered, Dear spirits. I know, Jensen said. I nearly yelped in fright when I saw it. Sebastian said that this was a fine weapon, too fine to bury, and he wanted me to keep it. He kept the soldier's short sword and axe for himself. I told him I would give this to you. He said that he hoped it would help you feel safe. Her mother slowly shook her head. This does not make me feel safe at all, knowing that a man carrying this was near us. Jen, I don't like that one bit. Not one bit. Her mother's eyes showed that she was on to worries bigger than the man Jensen had brought home with her. Mother, Sebastian is sick. Can he stay in the cave? I led him to believe that he has more to fear from us than we from him. Her mother glanced up with a sly smile. Good girl. They both knew that in order to survive, they had to work as a team with well-practiced roles they fell into without the need for formal discussion. She let out a sigh, then, as if with the burden of knowing all the things her daughter was missing in life, she ran a hand tenderly down Jensen's hair, letting it come to rest on her shoulder. All right, baby, she said at last. We'll let him stay the night. And feed him. I told him he would have a hot meal for helping me. Her mother's warm smile widened. And a meal, then. She drew the blade from its sheath, finally. She gave it a critical appraisal, turning it this way and that, inspecting its design. She tested the edge and then the weight. 
She spun it between her slender fingers to get the feel of it, the balance. At last, she held it in her open palm, contemplating the ornate letter R. Jensen could not imagine what terrible thoughts and memories must be going through her mother's mind as she silently considered the emblem representing the house of Rawl. Dear spirits, her mother whispered again to herself. Jensen didn't say anything. She entirely understood. It was an ugly, evil thing. Mother, Jensen whispered when her mother had looked at the handle for an eternity. It's almost dark. May I go get Sebastian and take him back to the cave? Her mother slid the blade home into its sheath, looking to put a panorama of painful memories away with it. Yes, I suppose you had better go get him. Take him to the cave. Make a fire for him. I'll cook some fish and bring some herbs along to help him sleep with his fever. Wait there with him until I come out. Keep your eye on him. We will eat with him out there. I don't want him in the house. Jensen nodded. She touched her mother's arm, halting her before she could go into the house. Jensen had one more thing to tell her mother. She dearly wished she didn't have to. She didn't want to bring her mother such a worry. But she had to. Father, she said, in a voice barely above a whisper, we are going to need to go from this place. Her mother looked startled. I found something on the Daharan soldier. Jensen pulled the piece of paper from her pocket, unfolded it, and held it out in her open palm. Her mother's gaze took in the two words on the paper. Dear spirits, was all she said, was all she was able to say. She turned and looked at the house, taking it all in, her eyes suddenly brimming with tears. Jensen knew that her mother had come to think of it as home, too. Dear spirits, her mother whispered to herself again, at a loss for anything more. Jensen thought the weight of it might overcome her, and her mother might break down in helpless tears. That was what Jensen wanted to do. Neither did. Her mother wiped a finger under each eye as she looked back at Jensen. And then she did cry, one brief inhalation of a gasping sob of hopelessness. I'm so sorry, baby. It broke Jensen's heart to see her mother in such anguish. Everything that Jensen had missed in life, her mother had missed twice over, once for herself and once for her daughter. On top of it, her mother had to be strong. We'll leave at first light, her mother said in simple pronouncement. Traveling at night and in the rain will serve us ill. We'll have to find a new place to hide. He's getting too close to this one. Jensen's own eyes overflowed with tears and her voice came only with great difficulty. I'm so sorry, Mama, that I'm such trouble. Her tears flooded forth in a painful torrent. She crushed the piece of paper as her hands fisted. I'm so sorry, Mama. I wish you could be free of me. Her mother caught her up in her arms then, cradling Jensen's head to a shoulder as she wept. No, no, baby, don't ever say that. You're my light, my life. This trouble is caused by others. Don't you ever wear a cloak of guilt because they are evil. You're my wonderful life. I would give everything else up a thousand times over for you, and then once again, and be joyous to do so. Jensen was glad that she would never have any children, for she knew she didn't have her mother's strength. She held on for dear life to the only person in the world who was a comfort to her. But then she pushed away from her mother's embrace. Mama Sebastian is from far away, he told me. He said that he's from beyond Dahara. There are other places, other lands. He knows of them. Isn't that wonderful? There is a place that isn't Dahara. But those places are beyond barriers and boundaries that can't be crossed. Then how can he be here? It must be so. Otherwise he could not have traveled here. And Sebastian is from one of these other lands? To the south, he said. The south? I don't see how it could be possible. Are you sure that's what he said? Yes, Jensen added a firm nod of confirmation. He said the south. He only mentioned it casually. I'm not sure how it's possible, but what if it is? Mother, maybe he could guide us there. Maybe, if we asked, he would guide us out of this nightmare land. As level-headed as her mother was, Jensen could see that she was considering this wild idea. It wasn't crazy. Her mother was thinking it over, so it couldn't be crazy. Jensen was suddenly filled with a sense of hope that maybe she had come up with something that would save them. Why would he do this for us? I don't know. I don't even know if he would consider it, or what he would want in return. I didn't ask him. I didn't dare even to mention it until I talked to you first. That's part of why I wanted him to stay here, so you could question him. I feared to lose this chance to discover if it really is possible. 
Her mother looked around again at the house. It was tiny, only one room, and it was nothing fancy, built from logs and wood they had shaped themselves, but it was warm and snug and dry. It was frightening to contemplate striking out in the dead of winter. The alternative of being caught, though, was far worse. Jensen knew what would happen if they were caught. Death would not come swiftly. If they were caught, death would come only after endless torture. At last, her mother gathered herself and spoke. That's good thinking, Jen. I don't know if anything can come of such an idea, but we'll talk to Sebastian and see. One thing is for sure. We have to leave. We dare not delay until spring. Not if they're this close. We'll leave at dawn. Mother, where will we go? This time, if Sebastian won't lead us away from Dahara. Her mother smiled. Baby, the world is a big place. We are only two small people. We will simply vanish again. I know it's hard, but we're together. It will be fine. We'll see some new sights now, won't we? Some more of the world. Now go get Sebastian and take him to the cave. I'll get started on dinner. We'll all need to have a good meal. Jensen quickly kissed her mother's cheek before racing down the trail. The rain was starting, and it was so gloomy among the trees that she could hardly see. The trees were all huge Daharan soldiers to her, broad, powerful, grim. She knew she would have nightmares after seeing a real Daharan soldier up close. Sebastian was still sitting on the rock, waiting. He stood as she rushed up to him. My mother said it was all right for you to sleep in the cave with the animals. She's started on cooking up the fish for us. She wants to meet you. He looked too tired to be happy, but he managed to show her a small smile. Jensen seized his wrist and urged him to follow her. He was already shivering with the wet. His arm was warm, though. Fever was like that, she knew. You shivered even though you were burning up. But with some food and herbs and a good night's rest, she was sure he would soon be well. What she wasn't sure of was if he would help them. Chapter 5 Betty, their brown goat, watched attentively from her pen, occasionally voicing her displeasure at sharing her home, as Jensen quickly collected straw to the side for the stranger in Betty's sanctuary. Bleeding her distress, Betty finally quieted when Jensen affectionately scratched the nervous goat's ears, patted the wiry hair covering her round middle, and then gave her half a carrot from the stash up on a high ledge. Betty's short upright tail wagged furiously. Sebastian shed his cloak and pack, but kept on the belt with his new weapons. He unstrapped his bedroll from under his pack and spread it out over the mat of straw. Despite Jensen's urging, he wouldn't lie down and rest while she knelt near the cave's entrance and prepared the fire pit. As he helped her stack dry kindling, she could see by the dim light coming from the window of the house on the other side of the clearing that sweat beaded his face. He repeatedly scraped his knife down the length of a branch swiftly building a clump of fluffy fibers. He struck a steel to flint several times, sending sparks through the darkness into the tinder he'd made. He cupped the fluff in his hands, and with gentle puffs of breath nursed the slow flames until they strengthened, then placed the burning tinder beneath the kindling, where the flames quickly grew and popped to life among the dry twigs. The branches released a pleasing fragrance of balsam as they caught flame. Jensen had been planning on running to the house not far off, to get some hot coals to start the fire, but he had it going before she could even suggest it. By the way he trembled, she imagined he was impatient for heat, even though he was burning with fever. She could smell the aroma of the frying fish coming from the house, and when the wind among the pine boughs died from time to time, she could hear the sizzle. The chickens retreated from the growing light into the deep shadows at the back of the cave. Betty's ears stood at attention as she watched Jensen for any signs that another carrot might be forthcoming. Her tail wagged in hopeful fits. The opening in the mountain was simply a place where, in some distant age past, a slab of rock had tumbled out, like some giant granite tooth come loose, to plunge down the slope and leave a dry socket behind. Now trees below grew among a collection of such fallen boulders. The cave only ran back about twenty feet, but the overhang of rock at the entrance further sheltered it and helped keep it dry. Jensen was tall, but the ceiling of the cave was high enough that she could stand in most of it, and since Sebastian was only a little taller than she, his spikes of snow-white hair, now a mellow orange in the firelight, didn't brush the top as he went to the back to collect some of the dry wood stacked there. The chickens squawked at being bothered, but then quickly settled back down. 
Jensen squatted on the opposite side of the fire from Sebastian with her back to the rain that had started so she could see his face in the firelight as they both warmed their hands in the heat of the crackling flames. After a day in the frigid, damp weather, the fire's warmth felt luxurious. She knew that sooner or later, winter would return with a vengeance. As cold and uncomfortable as it was now, it would get worse. She tried not to think about having to leave their snug home, especially at this time of year. She had known from the first instant she saw the piece of paper, though, that they might. Are you hungry? she asked. Starving, he said, looking as eager for the fish as Betty was for a carrot. The wonderful smells were making her stomach grumble, too. That's good. My mother always says that if you're ill and you have an appetite, then it can't be too serious. I'll be fine in a day or two. A rest will do you good. Jensen drew her knife from its sheath at her belt. We've never allowed anyone to stay here before. You will understand that we will be taking precautions. She could see in his eyes that he didn't know what she was talking about, but he shrugged his understanding of her prudence. Jensen's knife wasn't anything like the fine weapon the soldier had been carrying. They could afford nothing like that knife. Hers had a simple handle made of antler, and the blade wasn't thick, but she kept its edge razor sharp. Jensen used the blade to slice a shallow cut across the inside of her forearm. With a frown, Sebastian started to rise to voice a protest. Her challenging glare stopped him cold before he was halfway up. He sank back down and watched with growing concern as she wiped the sides of the blade through the crimson beads of blood welling up from the cut. She very deliberately looked him in the eye again before turning her back on him and moving out closer to the edge of the cave where the rain dampened the ground. With the knife wetted in blood, Jensen first drew a large circle. Feeling Sebastian's eyes on her, she next pulled the tip of the bloody blade through the damp earth in straight lines to make a square, its corners just touching the inside of the circle. With hardly a pause, she drew a smaller circle that touched the insides of the square. As she worked, she murmured prayers under her breath, asking the good spirits to guide her hand. It seemed the right thing to do. She knew that Sebastian could hear her soft sing-song, but not make out the words. It occurred unexpectedly to her that it must be something like the voices she heard in her own head. Sometimes, when she drew the outer circle, she heard the whisper of that dead voice call her name. Opening her eyes from the prayer, she drew an eight-pointed star, its rays piercing all the way through the inner circle, the square, and then the outer circle. Every other ray bisected a corner of the square. The rays were said to represent the gift of the Creator. So, as she drew the eight-pointed star, Jensen always whispered a prayer of thanks for the gift of her mother. When she finished and looked up, her mother was standing before her, as if she had risen from the shadows or materialized from the edge of the drawing itself to be lit by the leaping flames of the fire behind Jensen. In the light of those flames, her mother was like a vision of some impossibly beautiful spirit. Do you know what this drawing represents, young man? Jensen's mother asked, in a voice hardly more than a whisper. Jensen stared up at her, the way people often stared when they first saw her, and shook his head. It's called a grace. They have been drawn by those with the gift of magic for thousands of years. Some say since the dawn of creation itself. The outer circle represents the beginning of the eternity of the underworld, the keeper's world of the dead. The inner circle is the extent of the world of life. The square represents the veil that separates both worlds, life from death. It touches both at times. The star is the light of the gift from the Creator Himself. Magic, extending through life and crossing over into the world of the dead. The fire crackled and hissed as Jensen's mother, like some spectral figure, towered over the two of them. Sebastian said nothing. Her mother had spoken the truth, but it was truth used to convey a specific impression that was not true. My daughter has drawn this grace as protection for you as you rest this night, and as protection for us. There is another before the door to the house. She let the silence drag before adding, It would be unwise to cross either without our consent. I understand, Mrs. Daggett. In the firelight, his face showed no emotion. His blue eyes turned to Jensen. A hint of a smile came to his lips, even though his expression remained serious. You are a surprising woman, Jensen Daggett, a woman of many mysteries. I will sleep safely tonight. And well, Jensen's mother said, 
Besides the dinner, I brought some herbs to help you sleep. Her mother, holding the bowl full of fried fish in one hand, collected Jensen with a hand on her shoulder and guided her around to the back of the fire to sit beside her, on the opposite side of her from Sebastian. By the sober look on his face, their demonstration had had the desired effect. Her mother glanced at Jensen and gave her a smile Sebastian couldn't see. Jensen had done well. Holding the bowl out, her mother offered Sebastian some fish, saying, I would like to thank you, young man, for the help you gave Jensen today. Sebastian, please. So Jensen has told me. I was glad to help. It was helping myself, too, really. I'd not like to have Daharan soldiers chasing me. She pointed. If you would accept it, this one on top is coated with the herbs that will help you sleep. He used his knife to stab the darker piece of fish coated in the herbs. Jensen took another on her own knife after first wiping the blade clean on her skirts. Jensen tells me that you are from outside Dahara. He glanced up as he chewed. That's right. I find that hard to believe. Dahara is bordered by impassable boundaries. In my lifetime, no one has been able to come into or leave Dahara. How is it possible, then, that you have? With his teeth, Sebastian pulled the chunk of herb-coated fish off his knife. He inhaled between his teeth to cool the bite. He gestured around with the blade as he chewed. How long have you been out here alone in this great wood, without seeing people, without news? Several years. Oh, well then, I guess it makes sense that you wouldn't know. But since you've been out here, the barriers have come down. Jensen and her mother both took in this staggering, nearly incomprehensible news in silence. In that silence, they both dared to begin to imagine the heady possibilities. For the first time in Jensen's life, escape seemed conceivable. The impossible dream of a life of their own suddenly seemed only a journey away. They had been traveling and hiding their whole life. Now it seemed the journey might at last be near the end. Sebastian, Jensen's mother said, why did you help Jensen today? I like to help people. She needed help. I could tell how much that man scared her even though he was dead. He smiled at Jensen. She looked nice. I wanted to help her. Besides, he finally admitted, I don't much care for Daharan soldiers. When she gestured by lifting the bowl toward him, he stabbed another piece of fish. Mrs. Daggett, I'm liable to fall asleep before long. Why don't you just tell me what's on your mind? We are hunted by Daharan soldiers. Why? That's a story for another night. Depending on the outcome of this night, you may yet learn it. But for now, all that really matters is that we are hunted, Jensen more so than me. If the Daharan soldiers catch us, she will be murdered. Her mother made it sound simple. He would not let it be so simple. It would be much more grisly than any mere murder. Death would be a reward gained only after inconceivable agony and endless begging. Sebastian glanced over at Jensen. I'd not like that. Then we three are of a single mind, her mother murmured. That's why the two of you are good friends with those knives you keep at hand, he said. That's why, her mother confirmed. So, Sebastian said, you fear the Daharan soldiers finding you. Daharan soldiers aren't exactly a rarity. The one today gave you both a scare. What makes you both fear this one today so much? Jensen added a stout stick to the fire, glad to have her mother to do the talking. Betty bleated for a carrot, or at least attention. The chickens grumbled about the noise and light. Jensen, her mother said, show Sebastian the piece of paper you found on the Daharan soldier. Taken aback, Jensen waited until her mother's eyes turned her way. They shared a look that told Jensen her mother was determined to take this chance, and if she was to try, then they had to at least tell him some of it. Jensen drew the crumpled piece of paper from her pocket and handed it past her mother to Sebastian. I found this in that Taharan soldier's pocket. She swallowed at the ghastly memory of seeing a dead person, just before you showed up. Sebastian pulled the crumpled paper open, smoothing it between a thumb and finger as he cast them both a suspicious look. He turned the paper toward the firelight so he could see the two words. Jensen Lindy, he said, reading it from the piece of paper. I don't get it. Who's Jensen Lindy? Me, Jensen said. At least it was for a while. For a while? I don't understand. That was my name, Jensen said. The name I used, anyway, a few years back, when we lived far to the north. We move around often, to keep from being caught. 
We change our name each time, so it will be harder to track us. Then Daggett is not a real name either? No. Well, what is your real name then? That, too, is part of the story for another night. Her mother's tone said that she didn't mean to discuss it. What matters is that the soldier today had that name. That can only mean the worst. But you said it's a name you no longer use. You use a different name here, Daggett. No one here knows you by that name, Lindy. Her mother leaned toward Sebastian. Jensen knew her mother was giving him a look that he would find uncomfortable. Her mother had a way of making people nervous when she fixed them with that intent, penetrating gaze of hers. It may no longer be our name, a name we used only far to the north, but he had that name written down, and he was here, mere miles from where we are now. That means he has somehow connected that name with us, with two women somewhere up in this remote place, Somehow he connected it, or more precisely, the man who hunts us connected it and sent him after us. Now they search for us here. Sebastian broke her gaze and took a thoughtful breath. I see what you mean. He went back to eating the piece of fish skewered on the point of his knife. That dead soldier would have others with him, her mother said. By burying him, you bought us time. They won't know what happened to him. We have that much luck. We are still a few steps ahead of them. We must use our advantage to get away before they tighten the noose. We will have to leave in the morning. Are you sure? He gestured around with his knife. You have a life here. Your lives are remote, hidden. I would never have found you had I not seen Jensen with that dead soldier. How could they find you? You have a house, a good place. Life is the word that matters in all that you said. I know the man who hunts us. He has thousands of years of bloody heritage as guidance in hunting us. He will not rest. If we stay, sooner or later he will find us here. We must escape while we can. She pulled from her belt the exquisite knife Jensen had brought her from the dead Daharan soldier. Still in its sheath, she spun it in her fingers, presenting it hilt first to Sebastian. This letter R on the hilt stands for the House of Rahl, our hunter. He would only have presented a weapon this fine to a very special soldier. I don't want a weapon which has been presented by that evil man. Sebastian glanced down at the knife tendered, but didn't take it. He gave them both a look that unexpectedly chilled Jensen to the bone. It was a look that burned with ruthless determination. Where I come from, we believe in using what is closest to an enemy, or what comes from him, as a weapon against him. Jensen had never heard such a sentiment. Her mother didn't move. The knife still lay in her hand. I don't do you choose to use what he has inadvertently given you and turn it against him? Or do you choose instead to be a victim? What do you mean? Why don't you kill him? Jensen's jaw dropped. Her mother seemed less astonished. We can't, she insisted. He's a powerful man. He is protected by countless people, from simple soldiers to soldiers of great skill at killing, like the one you buried today, to people with the gift who can call upon magic. We are but two simple women. Sebastian was not moved by her plea. He won't stop until he kills you. He lifted the piece of paper, watching her eyes take it in. This proves it. He will never stop. Why don't you kill him before he kills you, kills your daughter? Or will you choose to be corpses he has yet to collect? Her mother's voice heated. And how do you propose we kill the Lord Rahl? Sebastian stabbed another piece of fish. For starters, you should keep the knife. It's a weapon superior to the one you carry. Use what is his to fight him. Your sentimental objection to taking it only serves him, not you or Jensen. Her mother sat still as stone. Jensen had never heard anyone talk like this. His words had a way of making her see things differently than she ever had before. I must admit that what you say makes sense, her mother said. Her voice came softly and laced with pain, or perhaps regret. You have opened my eyes, a little anyway. I don't agree with you that we should try to kill him, for I know him all too well. Such an attempt would be simple suicide at best, or accomplish his goal at worst. But I will keep the knife and use it to defend myself and my daughter. Thank you, Sebastian, for speaking sense when I didn't want to hear it. I'm glad you're keeping the knife, at least. Sebastian pulled the bite of fish off his own knife. I hope it can help you. Page 46 With the back of his hand, he wiped the sweat from his brow. If you don't want to try to kill him in order to save yourself, then what do you propose to do? Keep running? 
You say the barriers are down. I propose to leave Dahara. We will try to make it to another land where Dark and Rawl cannot hunt us. Sebastian looked up as he stabbed another piece of fish. Dark and Rawl? Dark and Rawl is dead. Jensen, having run from the man since she was little, having awakened countless times from nightmares of his blue eyes watching her from every shadow, or of him leaping out to snatch her when her feet wouldn't move fast enough, having lived every day wondering if this was the day he would finally catch her, having imagined a thousand times, and then another thousand, what terrible, brutal, torturous things he would do to her, having prayed to the good spirits every day for deliverance from her merciless hunter and his implacable minions, was thunderstruck. She realized only then that she had always thought of the man as next to immortal, as immortal as evil itself. Dark and Rawl, dead? It can't be, Jensen said as tears of deliverance welled up and ran down her cheeks. She was filled with a wild, heart-pounding sense of expectant hope, and at the same time an inexplicable shadow of dark dread. Sebastian nodded. It's true. About two years ago, from what I heard, Jensen gave voice to the hope. Then he is no longer the threat we thought, she paused. But if Darken Rall is dead... Darken Rall's son is Lord Rall now, Sebastian said. His son? Jensen felt her hope being eclipsed by that dark dread. The Lord Rahl hunts us, her mother said, her voice calm and enduring, betraying no evidence of even a moment of exalted hope. The Lord Rahl is the Lord Rahl. It is now as it has always been, as it will always be, as immortal as evil itself. Richard Rahl, Sebastian put in. He's the Lord Rahl now. Richard Rahl. So, now Jensen knew her hunter's new name. A terrifying thought washed over her. She had never before heard the voice say anything more than surrender and her name, and occasionally those strange foreign words she didn't understand. Now it demanded she surrender her flesh, her very will. If it was the voice of the one who hunted her, as her mother said, then this new Lord Rawl must be even more terrifyingly powerful than his wicked father. Fleeting salvation had left behind grim despair. This man, Richard Rawl, her mother said, searching for understanding amid all the startling news. He ascended to rule as the Lord Rawl of Dahara when his father died, then? Sebastian leaned forward, a cloaked rage unexpectedly surfacing in his blue eyes. Richard Rawl became the Lord Rawl of Dahara when he murdered his father and seized rule. And if you are next going to suggest that perhaps the son is less of a threat than his father, then let me set you straight. Richard Rawl is the one who brought down the barriers. At that, Jensen threw up her hands in confusion. But that would only give those who wish to be free their opening to escape Dahara, to escape him. No, he brought those ancient protective barriers down so he could extend his tyrannical rule to the lands that were beyond the reach of even his father. Sebastian thumped his chest once with a tight fist. My land he wants. Lord Rawl is a madman. Dahara is not enough for him to rule. He lusts to dominate the entire world. Jensen's mother stared off into the flames, looking dispirited. I always thought, hoped, I guess, that if Dark and Rawl were dead, then maybe we might have a chance. The piece of paper Jensen found today with her name on it now tells me that the son is even more dangerous than his father, and that I was only deluding myself. Even Dark and Rawl never got this close to us. Jensen felt numb after having been rocked by a turbulent swing of emotions, only to be left more terrified and hopeless than before. But seeing such despair on her mother's face wounded her heart. I will keep the knife. Her mother's decision said how much she feared the new Lord Rawl, and how frightful was their plight. Good. Dim light coming from the house reflected off the swollen pools of water standing beyond the cave entrance, but the droning rain churned the light into thousands of sparkles, like the tears of the good spirits themselves. In a day or two, the collection of ponds would be ice. Traveling would be easier in that cold than in cold rain. Sebastian, Jensen asked, do you think... Well, do you think we could escape Dahara? Maybe go to your homeland, escape the reach of this monster? Sebastian shrugged. Maybe. But until this madman is killed... Will there be anywhere beyond his ravenous reach? Her mother tucked the exquisite knife behind her belt and then folded her fingers together around one bent knee. Thank you, Sebastian. You've helped us. 
being in hiding has regrettably kept us in the dark. You've at least brought us a bit of light. Sorry it wasn't better news. The truth is the truth. It helps us know what to do. Her mother smiled at her. Jensen always was one who sought to know the truth of things. I have never kept it from her. Truth is the only means of survival. It's as simple as that. If you don't want to try to kill him in order to eliminate the threat, maybe you can think of some way to make the new Lord Ra lose interest in you, in Jensen. Jensen's mother shook her head. There are more things involved than we can tell you tonight, things you are in the dark about. Because of them, he will never rest, never stop. You don't understand the lengths to which the Lord Rall, any Lord Rall, will go in order to kill Jensen. If that's so, then perhaps you're right. Maybe the two of you should run. And would you help us, help her, to get away from Dahara? He looked from one of them to the other. If I can, I guess I could try. But I'm telling you, there is no place to hide. If you ever want to be free, you'll have to kill him. I'm no assassin, Jensen said, not so much out of protest as out of acceptance of her own frailty in the face of such brutal strength. I want to live, but I just don't have the nature to be an assassin. I will defend myself, but I don't think I could effectively set out to kill someone. The sad fact is, I just wouldn't be any good at it. He's a killer by birth. I'm not. Sebastian met her gaze with an icy look. His white hair cast red by the firelight framed cold blue eyes. You'd be surprised what a person can do if they have the proper motivation. Her mother lifted a hand to halt such talk. She was a practical woman, not given to wasting valuable time on wild schemes. Right now the important thing is for us to get away. Lord Rawls' minions are too close. That's the simple truth of it. From the description and this knife, the dead man you found today was probably part of a quad. Sebastian looked up with a frown. A what? A team of four assassins. On occasion, several quads will work together if the target has proven particularly elusive or is of inestimable worth. Jensen is both. Sebastian rested an arm over his knee. For someone on the run and in hiding all these years, you seem to know a lot about these quads. Are you sure you're right? Firelight danced in her mother's eyes. Her voice turned more distant. When I was young, I used to live at the People's Palace. I used to see those men, the quads. Dark and Rawl used them to hunt people. They are ruthless beyond anything you could imagine. Sebastian looked uneasy. Well, I guess you would know better than I. In the morning, then, we leave. He yawned as he stretched. Your herbs are already working, and this fever has exhausted me. After a good night's sleep, I'll help you both get away from here, away from Dahara, and on your way to the old world, if that's your wish. It is, her mother stood. You two eat the rest of the fish. As she moved past, her loving fingers trailed along the back of Jensen's head. I'm going to go collect some of our things, get together what we can carry. I'll be right in, Jensen said, as soon as I bank the fire. Chapter 6 The rain was getting worse. Runoff ran in a rippled sheet over the ledge at the brow of the cave. Jensen scratched Betty behind her ears to try to stop her bleating. The always nervous goat was suddenly inconsolable. Perhaps she sensed that they were going to be leaving. Maybe she was just unhappy that Jensen's mother had gone into the house. Betty loved that woman and would often follow her around the yard like a puppy. Betty would be only too happy to sleep in the house with them both if they would let her. Sebastian, having had his fill of fish, rolled himself in his cloak. His eyelids drooped as he tried to watch her bank the fire. He lifted his head and frowned over at the pacing goat. Betty will settle down when I go in the house, Jensen told him. Sebastian, already half asleep, mumbled something about Betty that Jensen couldn't even begin to hear over the noise of the rain. She knew it wasn't important enough to ask him to repeat it. He needed sleep. She yawned. Despite her anxiety over everything that had happened that day and her worry about what the next would bring, the din of the downpour was making her sleepy too. As much as she ached to ask him about what was beyond Ahara, she bid him a good night's sleep, even though she doubted that he heard her over the rain. She would have time enough to ask him all her questions. Her mother would be waiting for help with selecting what to take and packing it. They didn't have much, but they would have to leave some of what they had. At least the clumsy dead Daharan soldier had provided them with money just when they would need it most. It was enough money to buy horses and supplies that would help them get out of Dahara. 
The new Lord Rahl, the bastard son of a bastard son and an unbroken long line of bastard sons, had inadvertently provided them with the means to escape his grasp. Life was so precious. She just wanted her and her mother to be able to live their own lives. Somewhere over the distant dark horizon lay their new lives. Jensen threw her cloak around her shoulders. She pulled the hood up to protect herself from the rain, but as hard as it was coming down, she expected she was likely to get wet on the run to the house. She hoped the morning would dawn clear for their first day of travel so they could put distance between them and their pursuers. She was pleased to see that Sebastian looked dead to the world. He needed a good sleep. She was thankful that amid all the torment and injustice, at least he had come into their lives. Jensen picked up the bowl with the few remaining pieces of fish, tucked it under her cloak, held her breath, and, lowering her head against the onslaught, dove into the roaring rain. The cold shock of the downpour made her gasp as she splashed through the dark puddles on her dash to the house. She made the house, her wet lashes turning the dim light of the oil lamps and firelight coming through the window to a blinking blur. Without looking up, she threw the door open as she ran in. It's cold as the keeper's heart, she called out to her mother as she raced in. Jensen's breath left her lungs in a grunt as she crashed into a solid wall that had never been there before. Rebounding from the collision, she looked up to see a broad back turning, to see a huge hand snatching for her. The hand caught only her cloak. The heavy wool cloak stripped away from her as she fell back. The bowl thudded to the floor, spinning like a crazy top. The door bounced back from hitting the wall, banging closed behind her, trapping her just before her back slammed into it. Gasping, Jensen reacted. It was wild instinct, not deliberate thought. Jensen terror, not technique. Surrender. Desperation, not design. The man's blocky face was clearly lit by the fire from the hearth. He plunged toward her, a monster with stringy wet hair. Straining sinew and muscle twisted in rage, the knife in her fist whipped around, powered by stark terror. Her cry was a growl of panicked effort. Her knife slammed into the side of his head. The blade snapped at mid-length as it hit his cheekbone. His head twisted from the impact. Blood splashed across his face. Swinging madly, his meaty hand walloped her face. Her shoulder hit the wall. A shock of pain lanced her arm. She stumbled on something. Thrown off balance, she tumbled past her footing. Her face smacked the floor beside another of the huge men. He was like the dead soldier she had buried. Her mind grasped at snatches of what she was seeing, trying to make sense of it. Where did they come from? How were they in her house? Her leg was draped over the man's still legs. She pushed herself up. He was slumped against the wall. His dead eyes stared at her. The handle with the ornate R sideways below his ear reflected sparkles of firelight. The point of the knife jutted from the other side of his bull neck. He wore a wet red shirt. Surrender. With cold fright, she saw a man coming for her. Gripping her broken knife, she scrambled to her feet, turning toward the threat. She saw her mother on the floor. A man held her by the hair. There was blood everywhere. Nothing seemed real. In a nightmare vision, Jensen saw her mother's severed arm on the floor, fingers slack and open, red stab wounds. Jensen! Panic ruled her mind. She heard her own short, choppy screams. Wet blood splashed across the floor, glistened in the firelight. Whirling movement. A man slammed into her, driving her to the wall. She lost her breath. Pain crushed her chest. Surrender. No! Her own voice seemed unreal. She slashed with her broken knife, ripping the man's arm. He bellowed a vile oath. The man holding Jensen's mother dropped her and made for Jensen. She stabbed wildly, frantically at the men around her. Reaching hands shot toward her from all around. A huge hand clamped her thrashing knife arm. Surrender. Jensen gasped a cry. She struggled savagely. She kicked. She bit. Men cursed. The second man seized her throat in iron fingers. No breath, no breath. She tried, couldn't breathe, tried desperately, but couldn't draw a breath. He sneered as he squeezed her throat. Pain shot up through her temples. His cheek, slashed by her knife, laid open from ear to mouth, ran with gouts of blood. She could see glistening red teeth through the gaping wound. Jensen struggled but couldn't pull a breath. A fist slammed her stomach. She kicked him. He seized her ankle before she could kick him again. One was dead, two had her, her mother down. Her vision was narrowing to a black tunnel. Her chest burned. 
It hurts so much, so much. Sound was muffled. She heard a bone-jarring thunk. The man in front of her, squeezing her throat, staggered once as his head jerked. It made no sense to her. His grip went slack. She gasped an urgent breath. His head tipped forward. A crescent-bladed axe was embedded in the back of the man's neck, severing his spine. The axe handle swung in an arc as he dropped. Sebastian, measured fury with white hair, stood behind him. The last man let go of her arm. His other fist brought up a blood-slick sword. Sebastian was quicker than the man. Jensen was quicker even than Sebastian. Surrender! She cried out an animal sound, savage, unbridled terror and fury. Her broken blade slashed across the side of the man's neck. Her half-blade ripped bone deep, cut the artery, severed muscles. He cried out. Blood seemed to float, suspended in midair as the man pitched against the far wall on his way down. She'd swung so hard she fell sprawling with him. Sebastian's short sword struck like lightning, slamming through the great barrel chest with bone-cracking power. Jensen scrambled over the bodies, slipping on blood. She saw only her mother on the floor, half-sitting, leaning against the far wall. Her mother watched her come. Jensen couldn't stop screaming, couldn't breathe through her hysterical cries. Her mother, covered in blood, eyelids half-closed, looked as if she were falling asleep. But she had that spark of joy at seeing Jensen. Always that spark in her eyes. Her face had bloody streaks from big fingers down the side. She smiled her beautiful smile at seeing Jensen. Baby, she whispered. Jensen couldn't make herself stop screaming, shaking. She didn't look down at the awful red wounds. She saw only her mother's face. Mama, Mama, Mama! One arm embraced her. Her other was gone. Her knife arm, gone. The one around Jensen was love and comfort and shelter. Her mother smiled a weary smile. Baby, you did good. Now listen to me. Sebastian was there, working frantically to tie something around what was left of her mother's right arm, trying to stem the tide of blood. Her mother only saw Jensen. I'm here, Mama. Everything will be fine. I'm here. Mama, don't die. Don't die. Hold on, Mama, hold on. Listen. Her voice was hardly more than a breath. I'm listening, Mama, Jensen cried. I'm listening. I'm gone. I'm crossing to be with the good spirits now. No, Mama. No, please, no. Can't help it, baby. It's all right. The good spirits will take good care of me. Jensen held her mother's face in both hands, trying to see it through the helpless flood of tears. Jensen gasped with frantic sobs. Mama, don't leave me alone. Don't leave me. Please, oh, please don't. Oh, Mama, I love you. Love you, baby, more than anything. I've taught you all I can. Listen now. Jensen nodded, fearing to miss a single precious word. The good spirits are taking me. You must understand that. When I go, this body won't be me any longer. Understand? I don't need it anymore. It doesn't hurt at all. Not at all. Isn't that a wonder? I'm with the good spirits. You must be strong now, and leave what is no longer me. Mama! Jensen could only sob in agony as she held the face she loved more than life itself. He's coming for you, Jen. Run. Don't stay with this body that isn't me after I'm with the good spirits. Understand? No, Mama, I can't leave you. I can't. You must. Don't foolishly risk your life just to bury this useless body. It isn't me. I'm in your heart and with the good spirits. This body isn't me. Understand, baby? Yes, Mama, not you. You'll be with the good spirits, not here. Her mother nodded in Jensen's hands. Good girl. Take the knife. I took one out with it. It's a worthy weapon. Mama, I love you. Jensen wished for better words, but there were none. I love you. I love you. That's why you must run, baby. I don't want you to throw your life away over what is no longer me. Your life is too precious. Leave this empty vessel. Run, Jen, or he'll get you. Run. Her eyes turned toward Sebastian. Help her. Sebastian, right there, nodded. I swear I will. She looked back at Jensen and smiled her sweet love. I'll always be in your heart, baby. Always. Love you, always. Oh, Mama, you know I love you. Always. Her mother smiled as she watched her daughter. Jensen's fingers caressed her mother's beautiful face.
For a fleeting eternity, her mother watched her, until Jensen realized that her mother was no longer seeing anything in this world. Jensen fell against her mother, dissolving in tears and terror, choking in sobs. Everything had ended. The crazy, senseless world had ended. Her arms stretched out toward her mother as she was pulled away. Jensen, his mouth was close to her ear. We have to do what she wanted. No, please, oh please, no! She wailed. He gently pulled. Jensen, do as she asked. We must. Jensen pounded her fists against the blood-slicked floor. No. The world had ended. Oh, please, no, no, it can't be. Jen, we have to go. You go. She sobbed. I don't care. I give up. No, Jen, you don't. You can't. His arm around her middle lifted her, set her on her wobbly legs. Numb. Jensen couldn't move. Nothing was real. Everything was a dream. The world was crumbling to ash. Holding her by her upper arms, he shook her. Jensen, we have to get out of here. She turned her head and looked at her mother on the floor. We have to do something, please. We have to do something. Yes, we do. We have to leave before more men show up. His face was dripping. She wondered if it was rain, as if she were watching herself from some great disconnected distance. Her own thoughts seemed crazy to her. Jensen, listen to me. Her mother had said that. It was important. Listen to me. We have to get out of here. Your mother was right. We have to go. He turned to the pack beside the lamp on the table at the side of the room. Jensen slumped to the floor. Her knees hit with a thump. She was empty of everything but the hot coals of agony from which she could not pull away. Why did everything have to be so wrong? Jensen crawled toward her sleeping mother. She couldn't die. She couldn't. Jensen loved her too much for her to die. Jensen, grieve later. We have to get out of here. Out the open door, the rain poured down. I won't leave her. Your mother made a sacrifice for you, so you would have a life. Don't throw away her final act of courage. He was stuffing whatever he could find in a pack. You have to do as she said. She loves you and wants you to live. She told you to run. I swore I'd help you. We have to leave before they catch us here. She stared at the door. It had been closed. She remembered crashing into it. Now it stood open. Maybe the latch broke. A huge shadow materialized out of the rain. Melting through the doorway into the house, the brawny man's eyes fixed on her. Feral fright surged through her. He moved toward her, faster and faster. Jensen saw the knife with the ornate R sticking from the side of a dead man's neck. The knife her mother told her to take. It wasn't far. Her mother had lost her arm, her life to kill him. The man, seemingly oblivious of Sebastian, dove for Jensen. She dove for the knife. Her fingers, greasy with blood, seized the handle. The worked metal gave good grip. Art with purpose, deadly art. With teeth gritted, she yanked the blade free and rolled. Before the man reached her, Sebastian growled with the effort of burying his axe in the back of the man's head. The soldier crashed to the floor beside her, his meaty arm falling across her middle. Jensen, crying out, wriggled out from under the arm as blood grew in a dark pool beneath his head. Sebastian pulled her up. Get whatever you want to take, he ordered. She moved through the room, walking in a dream. The world had gone mad. Perhaps it was she who had finally gone mad. The voice in her head whispered to her in its strange language. She found herself listening, almost comforted by it. Tu vas mischt, tu vas mischt, grushtiva du kalt mischt. We have to go, Sebastian said. Get what you want to take. She couldn't think. She didn't know what to do. She blocked the voice and told herself to do as her mother said to do. She went to the cupboard and rapidly began picking things out that they always took when they traveled. Things always at the ready. Traveling clothes were kept in her pack, ready to leave at a moment's notice. She threw herbs, spices, and dried food in on top of them. She pulled other clothes, a brush, a small mirror, from a simple chest of woven branches. Her hand paused when she started grabbing her mother's clothes for her. She stopped, fingers trembling, focusing on her mother's orders. She couldn't think, so she moved like a trained animal. Doing as she had been taught, they'd had to run before. She scanned the room: four dead Daharans, one that morning. That made five. A quad plus one. Where were the other three? In the dark outside the door, in the trees, in the dark woods, waiting, waiting to take her to Lord Rall to be tortured to death. With both hands, Sebastian seized her wrist. Jensen, what are you doing? She realized she was stabbing at the empty air. She watched as he pried the knife from her fist and returned it to its sheath. He tucked it behind her belt. 
He scooped up her cloak, which the huge Daharan soldier had ripped off her as she had first fallen into the nightmare. Hurry up, Jensen. Grab anything else you want. Sebastian rifled through the dead men's pockets, pulling out money he found, cramming it in his own pockets. He unstrapped all four knives, none as good as the one he'd tucked behind her belt, the one with the ornate letter R on the handle, the one from the fallen dead man, the one her mother had used. Sebastian slipped the four knives down the side of the pack as he yelled at her again to hurry. While he took the best sword from one of the men, Jensen went to the table. She scooped up candles and stuffed them in the pack. Sebastian attached the scabbard of the sword to his weapons belt. Jensen collected small implements, cooking utensils, pots, pushing them in her pack. She wasn't really aware of what she was taking. She was just picking up whatever she saw and putting it in. Sebastian lifted her pack, took one of her wrists, and stuffed it through the strap, as if he were handling a rag doll. He put her other arm through the other strap he held out for her, then threw her cloak around her shoulders. After he pulled the hood up over her head, he stuffed her red hair in the sides. He held her mother's pack in one hand. He tugged twice and freed his axe from the soldier's skull. Blood ran down the handle as he hooked the axe on his weapon's belt. With the heel of his sword hand against the small of her back, he urged her onward. Anything else? he asked as they moved toward the door. Jensen! Do you want anything else from your house before we go? Jensen looked over her shoulder at her mother on the floor. She's gone, Jensen. The good spirits are taking care of her now. She's smiling down on you now. Jensen looked up at him. Really? You think so? Yes. She's in a better world now. She told us to go from here. We have to do what she said. In a better world, Jensen clung to that idea. Her world held only anguish. She moved toward the door, doing as Sebastian said to do. He scanned in every direction. She simply followed, stepping over bodies, over bloody arms and legs. She was too scared to feel anymore, too heartsick to care. Her thoughts seemed completely muddled. She had always prided herself on her clear thinking. Where had her clear thinking gone? In the rain, he pulled her by her arm toward the path down. Betty, she said, digging in her heels. We have to get Betty. He gazed at the path, then toward the cave. I don't think we need bother with the goat, but I should get my pack my things. She saw he was standing in the downpour without his cloak. He was soaked to the skin. It occurred to her that she wasn't the only one who wasn't thinking clearly. He was so intent on escaping that he almost left his things. That would be the death of him. She couldn't let him die. Betty would help, but there was one other thing that she remembered. Jensen ran back in the house. She ignored Sebastian's yells. Inside, she wasted no time rushing to a small wooden chest just inside the door. She looked at nothing else as she pulled out two bundled sheepskin cloaks, one hers, one her mother's. They kept them there, rolled and tied, at the ready, in case they ever had to leave in a hurry. He watched from the doorway, impatient but silent, when he saw what she was doing. Without looking death in the eye, she rushed back out of her house for the last time. Together they ran to the cave. The fire was still crackling hot. Betty paced and trembled, but was uncharacteristically silent, as if knowing something was terribly wrong. Dry yourself a bit first, she said. We don't have time. We have to get out of here. The others could come at any moment. You'll freeze to death if you don't. Then what good will running do? Dead is dead. Her own reasoned words surprised her. Jensen pulled the two rolled sheepskin cloaks from under her wool cloak and started working loose the knots in the thongs. These will help keep the rain out, but you need to get dry first, otherwise you won't stay warm enough. He was nodding as he shivered and rubbed his hands before the fire, the sense of what she said finally overcoming his urgency to be gone. She wondered how he managed to do all he had done with a fever, and after having taken herbs. Fear, she guessed. Stark, raving fear. That she understood. Her whole body ached. Not only had she been banged around, but she saw now that her shoulder was bleeding. The cut wasn't bad, but it throbbed. The sustained level of terror had left her drained and exhausted. She wanted only to lie down and cry, but her mother had told her to get away. Only her mother's words motivated her now. Without those last commands, Jensen would be unable to function. Now she simply did what her mother had told her to do. Betty was beside herself. The distraught goat tried to climb the pen to get to Jensen. As Sebastian hovered over the fire, Jensen tied a rope around Betty's neck. The goat was as thankful to be going as a goat could be. They would give Betty a chance to return the favor. When they had gotten away and found at least simple shelter, they would not be able to build a fire on such a wet night. If they could find a dry hole, a spot under a rock ledge or beneath fallen trees, they would hunker down beside the goat. 
Betty would keep them both warm so they wouldn't freeze to death. Jensen understood the plaintive calls Betty made toward the house. The goat's ears were at attention. Betty was worried for the woman who wasn't going. Jensen collected all the carrots and acorns off the shelf, stuffing them in pockets and packs. When Sebastian was as dry as he was going to allow himself to get, they donned their wool cloaks and topped them with the sheepskin. With Jensen leading Betty by the rope, they started out into the drenching darkness. Sebastian headed for the trail down from the front, the way he had come in. Jensen seized his arm, stopping him. They might be waiting down there. But we have to get out of here. I have a better way. We made an escape route. He gazed at her a moment through the fall of icy rain separating them, then, without further protest, followed her into the unknown. Chapter 7 Oba Schalk snatched the chicken by the neck and lifted it from the nest box. The chicken's head looked tiny above his meaty fist. With his other hand, he fished a warm brown egg from the bottom of the depression in the straw. He gently placed the egg in the basket with the others. Oba didn't set the chicken back down. He grinned as he lifted it closer to his face, watching its head twist from side to side, its beak open and close, open and close. He put his own lips close, so the beak was touching his lips, then with all his might he blew in the chicken's open mouth. The chicken squawked and flapped, madly trying to escape the vice-like fist. A deep laugh rolled up from Oba's throat. Oba! Oba! Where are you? When he heard his mother hollering for him, Oba plopped the chicken back on its nest. His mother's voice had come from the nearby barn. Squawking its terror, the chicken fled the hen house. Oba followed it out of the coop and then trotted toward the door to the barn. The week before, they had had a rare winter downpour. By the following day, the standing water had frozen and the rain had turned to snow. Wind-swept snow now hid the ice, making for treacherous footing. Despite his size, Oba negotiated the icy conditions without much difficulty. Oba prided himself on being light on his feet. It was important for a person not to let their body or mind become slow and dull. Oba believed it was important to learn new things. He believed it was important to grow. He thought it was important for a person to use what they had learned. That was how people grew. The barn and house were one small structure made of wattle and daub, woven branches covered with a mixture of clay, straw, and dung. Inside, the house and barn were separated by a stone wall. After he'd built the house, Oba had made the wall inside by stacking flat gray rocks from the field. He had learned the technique from observing a neighbor stack rocks at the side of his field. The wall was a luxury most homes didn't have. Hearing his mother yell his name again, he tried to think of what he could have done wrong. As he perused his mental list of the chores she'd told him to do, he couldn't recall one in the barn that he'd failed to do. Oba wasn't forgetful, and besides, they were chores he did often. There shouldn't be anything in the barn to have set her off. True as all that was, none of it shielded him from incurring his mother's ire. She could think of things that needed doing that had never before needed doing. Oba! Oba! How many times do I need to call for you? In his mind's eye, he could see her mean little mouth all pinched up as she said his name, expecting him to appear the instant she screeched for him. The woman had a voice that could unwind a good rope. Oba turned sideways to fit his shoulders through the small side door into the barn. Rats squeaked and scurried away at his feet. The barn, with a hayloft above, housed their milk cow, two hogs, and two oxen. The cow was still in the barn. The hogs had been turned loose in the oak stand to rut for acorns under the snow. Oba could see the hind ends of both oxen through the larger barn door out to the yard on the other side. His mother stood on the low hill of frozen muck, hands on her hips, the cold smoke of her breath rising from her nostrils like a dragon's fiery snort. Mother was a big-boned woman, broad in the shoulders and hips, broad everywhere, even her forehead was broad. He had heard people say that when his mother was younger she had been a handsome woman, and indeed, when he had been a boy, she had had a number of suitors. Year by year, though, the struggles of life had worn away her looks, leaving behind deeply etched lines and sagging folds of flesh. The suitors had long ago stopped coming around. Oba made his way across the black icy ground inside the barn and stood before her, hands in his pockets. She walloped the side of his shoulder with a stout stick. Oba! He flinched when she whacked him three times more, each swat punctuating his name. Oba! 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 When he had been young, such a thrashing would have left him black and blue. He was too big and strong now for her stick to hurt him. 
That made her angry, too. While he wasn't bothered much by the stick now that he was grown, the condemnation in her voice whenever she spoke his name still made his ears burn. She reminded him of a spider with a mean little mouth, a black widow spider. He hunched, trying not to look so big. What is it, Mama? Where are you loafing when your mother calls? Her face screwed up, a plum long ago turned to a prune. Oba the ox, Oba the dimwit, Oba the oaf, where were you? Oba lifted his arm defensively as she cracked him with the stick again. I was getting the eggs, Mama. Getting the eggs. Look at this mess. Don't it ever occur to you to do anything round here unless someone with brains tells you to? Oba looked around, but didn't see what needed doing other than the regular work that would have set her off so. There was always work to do. Rats stuck their noses out from under boards in the stalls, whiskers twitching as they sniffed, watching with beady black eyes listening with little rat ears. He looked back at his mother but had no answer. None would suit her anyway. She pointed at the ground. Look at this place. Don't you ever think to scoop out the muck? Soon as it thaws, it'll be running under the wall and into the house where I sleep. Do you think I feed you for nothing? Don't you think you have to earn your keep, you lazy oaf? Oba the oaf? She had already used the last invective. Oba was surprised sometimes that she wasn't more creative, didn't learn new things. When he had been little, she had seemed to him a mind-reader of inscrutable ability with a talented tongue that could cut him with knowing lashes. Now that he had grown so much larger than her, he sometimes wondered if other aspects of his mother were less formidable than he had once feared, wondered if her power over him wasn't somehow artificial, an illusion, a scarecrow with a mean little mouth. Yet she still had a way about her that could cut him down to nothing. And she was his mother. A person was supposed to mind their mother. That was the most important thing a person could do. She had taught him that lesson well. Oba didn't think he could do much more to earn his keep. He worked from sun up to sundown. He prided himself on not being lazy. Oba was a man of action. He was strong and worked as hard as any two men. He could best any man he knew. Men didn't give him any trouble. Women, though, stymied him. He never knew what to do around women. Big as he was, women had a way of making him feel puny. He scuffed his boot against the dark, rippled, slick mound underfoot, assessing the rock-hard mass. The animals added to it continually, much of it freezing before it could all be scooped out, allowing it to build in layers throughout the long, cold winter. Periodically, Oba scattered straw over the top for better footing. He'd not want his mother to slip and fall. It wasn't long, though, before the layer of straw became slicked over, and it was time for another. But, Mama, the ground's all frozen. In the past... He had always scooped it out as it thawed and could be worked. In the spring, when it got warmer and the flies filled the barn with their constant buzzing, it would come off in layers where the straw was. But not now. Now it was welded together into a solid mass. Always an excuse, isn't that right, Oba? Always an excuse for your mother, you worthless bastard boy. She folded her arms, glowering at him. He couldn't hide from the truth, couldn't pretend, and she knew it. Oba peered around in the dark barn and saw the heavy steel scoop shovel leaning against the wall. I'll scoop it, Mama. You go back to your spinning and I'll scoop the barn good. He didn't exactly know how he was going to scoop the solid frozen muck, only that he had to. Get started now, she huffed. Use what light is left of the day. When it gets dark, then I want you to go to town to get me some medicine from Lathea. Now he knew why she had come to the barn looking for him. My knees is aching me again, she complained, as if she wanted to cut off any objection he might voice, even though he never did. He thought it, though. She always seemed to know what he was thinking. Today you can get started in the barn, and tomorrow you can go back to scraping the muck all the way down until you clean it all out. Before the day wears on, though, I want you to go get my medicine. Oba pulled on his ear as he cast his gaze toward the ground. He didn't like going to see Lathea, the woman with the cures. He didn't like her. She always looked at him like he was a worm. She was mean as rake. Worse, she was a sorceress. If Lathea didn't like someone, they suffered for it. Everybody was afraid of Lathea, so Oba didn't feel so singled out. Still, though, he didn't like going to see her. I will, Mama. I'll fetch your medicine. And don't you worry, I'll get to work at scraping the muck out, just like you said. I have to tell you every little thing, don't I, Oba? Her glare burned into him. I don't know why I bothered raising such a worthless bastard boy, she added under her breath. 
should have done what Lethea told me in the beginning. Oba heard her say this often when she was feeling sorry for herself, sorry that no suitors came around anymore, sorry that none had wanted to marry her. Oba was a curse she bore with bitter regret, a bastard child who'd brought her trouble from the first. If not for Oba, maybe she would have gotten herself a husband to provide for her. And don't you be staying in town with any foolishness. I won't, Mama. I'm sorry that your knees are bad today. She whacked him with the stick. They wouldn't be so bad if I didn't have to follow around a big dumb ox seeing that he does what he should already be doing. Yes, Mama. Did you get the eggs? Yes, Mama. She eyed him suspiciously, then pulled a coin from her flaxen apron. Tell Athea to make up a remedy for you too, along with my medicine. Maybe we can yet rid you of the keeper's evil. If we could get the evil out of you, maybe you wouldn't be so worthless. His mother, from time to time, sought to purge him of what she believed to be his evil nature. She tried all sorts of potions. When he was little, she had often forced him to drink burning powder she mixed with soapy water. Then she would lock him in a pen in the barn, hoping the otherworldly evil wouldn't like being burned and locked up both and would flee his restrained earthly body. His pen didn't have slats like the pens for the animals did. It was made of solid boards. In the summer, it was an oven. When she made him take burning powder and then dragged him by the arm and locked him in the pen, he near to died of terror that she'd never let him out or never let him have a drink of water. He welcomed the beatings she would give him to try to silence his screams, just to be let out. You buy my medicine from Lathea and a remedy for you. His mother held up the small silver coin as her eyes narrowed into a spiteful squint. And don't you go wasting any of this on women. Oba felt his ears heating. Each time his mother sent him to buy something, whether medicine or leatherwork or pottery or supplies, she always admonished him not to waste the money on women. He knew that when she told him not to waste it on women, she was mocking him. Oba didn't have the courage to say much of anything to women. He always bought what his mother said to buy. He never once wasted it on anything. He feared his mother's wrath. He hated that she always told him not to waste the money when he never did. It made him feel like she thought he was intending to do wrong even though he wasn't. It made him guilty even though he had done no wrong. It made what was in his thoughts, even if he didn't have them, a crime. He tugged on a burning ear. I won't waste it, Mama. And dress respectable, not like some dumb ox. You already reflect badly enough on me. I will, Mama, you'll see. Oba ran around to the house and fetched his felt cap and brown woolen jacket for his journey to Gretton, a couple miles northwest. She watched him carefully hang them on a peg where they would stay clean until he was ready to go to town. With the scoop shovel, he started in on the rock-hard muck. The steel shovel rang like a bell each time he rammed it at the frozen ground. He grunted with each mighty blow. Chips of black ice burst forth, splattering his trousers. Each was but an infinitesimal speck from the dark mountain of muck. It was going to take a long time and a lot of work. He didn't mind hard work, though. Time he had in abundance. Mother watched from the doorway of the barn for a few minutes to make sure he was working up a sweat as he chipped away at the frozen mound. When she was satisfied, she vanished from the doorway to go back to her own work, leaving him to think about his coming visit to Lathea. Oba. Oba paused. The rats back in the small places stilled. Their little black rat eyes watched him watching them. The rats went back to their search for food. Oba listened for the familiar voice. He heard the door to the house close. Mother, a spinster, was going back to spinning her wool. Mr. Tuchman brought her wool, which she spun into thread for him to use on his loom. The meager pay helped support her and her bastard son. Oba. Oba knew the voice well. He'd heard it ever since he could remember. He never told his mother about it. She would be angry and think that it was the keeper's evil calling to him. She would want to force him to swallow even more potions and cures. He was too big to be locked in the pen anymore, but he wasn't too big to drink Lathea's cures. When one of the fat rats scurried past, Oba stepped on its tail, trapping it. Oba! The rat squeaked a little rat squeak. Little rat legs scrambled, trying to get away. Little rat claws scratched against the black ice. Oba reached down and seized the fat furry body. He peered at the whiskered face. The head twisted futilely. Beady black eyes watched him. Those eyes were filled with fear. Surrender. Oba thought it was vitally important to learn new things. Quick as a fox, 
he bit off the rat's head. Chapter 8 From what seemed to her the least troublesome corner of the room, Jensen kept an eye on the door as well as the boisterous crowd. Half a room away, Sebastian leaned on the thick wooden plank counter, speaking to the innkeeper. She was a big woman, and with a forbidding scowl that made her look like she was as used to trouble as she was prepared to deal with it. The room full of people, mostly men, were a jovial lot. Some of the men played at dice or other table games, some arm wrestled. Most were drinking and telling jokes that would set tables of them off in peals of fist-pounding laughter. Laughter sounded obscene to Jensen. There was no joy in her world. There could be none. The past week was a blur. Or was it more than a week? She couldn't recall exactly how long they had been traveling. What did it matter? What did anything matter? Jensen was unaccustomed to people. People had always represented danger to her. Groups of them made her nervous, people at an inn, drinking and gambling even more so. When men noticed her standing at the end of the counter near the wall, they forgot the jokes or paused at their dice and lingered on the sight of her. Meeting their gazes, she pushed the hood of her cloak back, letting her thick rings of red hair fall over the front of her shoulders. That was enough to turn their eyes back to their own business. Jensen's red hair spooked people, especially those who were superstitious. Red hair was uncommon enough that it raised suspicion. It gave people a worry that she might be gifted, or perhaps that she might even be a witch. Jensen, by boldly meeting their gazes, played on such fears. It had in the past helped to protect her, oftentimes better than a knife could have. Back at her house, it hadn't helped one little bit. After the men turned away from her and went back to their dice and drinks, Jensen looked back down the counter. The stout innkeeper was staring at her, at her red hair. When Jensen met her gaze, the woman quickly turned her attention back to Sebastian. He asked her another question. She bent closer as she spoke to him. Jensen couldn't hear them over the roar of all the talking, joking, betting, cheering, cursing, and laughing. Sebastian nodded to the woman's words, spoken close to his ear. She pointed off over the heads of her customers, apparently giving directions. Sebastian straightened and pulled a coin from his pocket, then slid it across the counter toward the woman. After taking the coin, she traded it for a key from a box behind her. Sebastian scooped the key off the counter worn smooth by countless mugs and hands. He picked up his own mug and bid the woman a good day. When he reached the end of the counter, he leaned close to Jensen so she could hear him and gestured with his mug. You sure you wouldn't like a drink? Jensen shook her head. He kept an eye on the room full of people. They were all once again engaged in their own business. It was a good thing you pushed your hood back. Until the woman of the house saw that red hair of yours, she was playing dumb. After that, her tongue loosened. The woman knows her? She is still living here in Gretton, as my mother said? The innkeeper is sure? Sebastian took a long drink, watching a roll of dice bring a cheer for the winner. She gave me directions. And you got us rooms? Only one room. As he took another swig, he saw her reaction. Better to be together in case of trouble. I thought it would be safer with us both in one room. I'd rather sleep with Betty. Realizing how that must have sounded, she looked away in embarrassment and added, Than in an inn, I mean. I'd rather be by myself than where there are so many people so close all around. I'd feel safer in the woods than closed in a room here. I didn't mean... I know what you meant. Sebastian's blue eyes took up his smile. It will do you good to sleep inside. It's going to be a bitter night and Betty will be better sheltered at the stable. The man who ran the stable had been a bit surprised to be asked to stable a goat for the night, but horses enjoyed the company of goats, so he was accommodating. That first night, Betty had probably saved their lives. Sebastian, with his fever, might not have survived had Jensen not found a dry place under a jut of ledge. The back of the small cleft beneath the overhang narrowed to a point, but it was big enough for the two of them. Jensen had cut balsam and fur limbs to line the depression, lest the cold rock sap their bodies of heat. She and Sebastian then wedged themselves into the back. With Jensen's urging, and with the aid of the rope, Betty knelt behind the pine boughs positioned over the opening and then lay down close before them. With Betty's body against them, blocking the cold and providing her warmth, they had a dry, warm bed. Jensen quietly wept the long, miserable night away. She was at least relieved that Sebastian, feverish, was able to sleep. By morning, his fever had broken. Morning had been the first day of Jensen's bleak new life without her mother. 
Leaving her mother's body there at the house all alone constantly haunted Jensen. The memory of the horrifying bloody sight gave her nightmares. That her mother was gone brought limitless tears and crushed Jensen with heartache. Life seemed desolate and meaningless. But Sebastian and Jensen had escaped. They had survived. That instinct to survive and knowing all that her mother had done to give Jensen life kept her going. At times, she wished she were not such a coward and could simply face the end and be done with it. At other times, the terror of being pursued kept her putting one foot in front of the other. At yet other moments, she felt a sense of fierce commitment to life, to not allowing all her mother's sacrifices to be in vain. We should have some supper, Sebastian said. They have lamb stew. Then maybe you should get a good night's sleep in a warm bed before we go see this old acquaintance of yours. I'll stand watch while you sleep. Jensen shook her head. No, let's go see her now. We can sleep later. She had seen people eating thick stew from wooden bowls. The thought of food held no appeal for her. Sebastian studied the look on her face and saw that he wasn't going to talk her out of it. He drained the mug and set it on the counter. It's not far. We're on the right side of town. Outside in the gathering dusk, she asked, Why did you want to stay here at this inn? There were other places much nicer, where the people didn't look so rough. His blue-eyed gaze swept the buildings, the dark doorways, the alleys, as his fingers touched his cloak, seeking the reassurance of the hilt of his sword. A rough crowd asks fewer questions, especially the kind of questions we don't want to answer. He seemed to her a man who was used to avoiding having questions asked of him. She stepped along the narrow furrow of a frozen rut, following it down the road toward the woman's house, a woman Jensen only dimly remembered. She held on tightly to the hope that the woman might be able to help. Her mother must have had some reason for not going to this woman again, but Jensen could think of nothing else to try but to seek her aid. Without her mother, Jensen needed help. The other three members of the quad were surely hunting her. Five men dead told her that there were at least two quads, that would mean at least three of those killers were still after her. It was entirely possible there were more. It was probable that even if there were not more, there soon would be. They had escaped by using the hidden trail away from her house. The men probably wouldn't have been expecting that, so she and Sebastian had gained the temporary safety of distance. The rain would have done a good job of covering any tracks. It was possible that the two of them had gotten away cleanly and were for the time being safe, but since her pursuer was the Lord Rahl himself, it was also possible that the killers were, by some dark and mysterious means, moment by moment, closing in on her. After the horrifying encounter with the huge soldiers at her house, the terror of that possibility always loomed in Jensen's fears. At a deserted corner, Sebastian pointed to the right. Down this street. They walked past dark buildings, square and windowless, that suggested to her that maybe they were only used for storage. No one seemed to live down the street. Before long, they'd left the buildings behind. Trees, naked before the bitter wind, huddled in clumps. When they came to a narrow road, Sebastian pointed. By the directions, it's the house down this road, down at the end, in that stand of trees. The road looked to be little used. Weak light from a distant window stole through bare branches of oak and alder. The light, rather than warm invitation, shone more like a glowing warning to stay away. Why don't you wait here, she said. It might be better if I went alone. She was providing him with an excuse. Most people didn't want anything to do with the sorceress. Jensen herself wished she had some other choice. I'll go with you. He had shown a distinct distrust of anything to do with magic. The way his eyes watched the dark place off through the branches and brushed to the sides, he might have been trying to sound more brave than he was. Jensen admonished herself for even thinking such thoughts. He had fought Daharan soldiers who not only had been much bigger than he, but had outnumbered him. He could have simply stayed out in the cave and not risked his life. He could have left the scene of such carnage and gone on with his life. Fearing magic only proved him of sound mind. She, of all people, could understand fearing magic. Snow crunched under their boots as the two of them, after reaching the end of the road, made their way along the narrow path through the trees. Sebastian watched off to the sides while her attention was mostly fixed on the house. Behind the small place, the woods marched off up foothills. Jensen imagined that only those with a strong need dared walk the path toward this door. Jensen reasoned that if the sorceress lived this near into town, then she must be someone who helped people, 
someone whom people trusted. It was entirely possible that the woman was a valued and respected member of the community, a healer devoted to helping others, not someone to fear. As the wind moaned through the trees looming around her, Jensen rapped on the door. Sebastian's gaze studied the woods to each side. Off behind them, the lights from homes and businesses would at least provide light enough for them to find their way back. As she waited, Jensen's gaze, too, was drawn to the gloom all around. She imagined eyes in the darkness watching her, the hairs at the back of her neck lifted. The door finally drew in, but only as wide as the face of the woman peering out at them. Yes? Jensen couldn't clearly make out the shadowed features of the face, but by the light coming out through the partly opened door, the woman could see Jensen plainly enough. Are you Lethea? she asked. Lethea, the sorceress? Why? We were told that Lethea the sorceress lives here. If that's you, may we come in? Still, the door didn't open any wider. Jensen pulled her cloak tighter against the cold night air as well as the chilly reception. The woman's steady look took in Sebastian, then Jensen's form hidden within a heavy cloak. I'm not a midwife. If you want to get yourself out of the trouble you two are in, I can't help with that. Go see a midwife. Jensen was mortified. That's not why we're here. The woman peered out for a moment, considering the two strangers at her door. What sort of medicine do you need, then? No medicine. Uh, spell. I've met you before once. I need a spell like you once cast for me, when I was little. The face in the shadows frowned. When? Where? Jensen cleared her throat. Back at the People's Palace, when I lived there. You helped me when I was little. Helped you what? Speak up, girl. Helped hide me. With some kind of spell, I believe. I was little at the time, so I don't recall exactly. Hide you? From Lord Raal. There was an awful silence from the house. Do you remember? My name is Jensen. I was very little at the time. Jensen pushed her hood back so the woman could see her ringlets of red hair lit in the wedge of light coming through the door. Jensen. Don't recall the name, but the hair I remember. It's not often one sees hair like yours. Jensen's spirits buoyed with relief. It has been a while. I'm so glad to hear that... I don't deal in your kind, the woman said. Never have. I cast no spell for you. Jensen was stunned speechless. She didn't know what to say. She was sure the woman had once cast a spell to help her. Now be gone, the both of you. The door started to close. Wait, please... I can pay. Jensen reached into a pocket and hurriedly brought out a coin. Only after she passed it through the door did she see that it had been gold. The woman inspected the gold mark for a time, perhaps considering if it was worth becoming involved again in what was sure to be a high crime, even for what amounted to a small fortune. Now do you remember? Sebastian asked. The woman's eyes turned to him. And who are you? Just a friend. Lathea, I need your help again. My mother... Jensen couldn't bring herself to say it and started over in a different direction. I remember my mother telling me about you and how you helped us once. I was very little at the time, but I remember having the spell cast over me. It wore off years ago. I need that help again. Well, you have the wrong person. Jensen's fists tightened on her wool cloak. She had no other ideas. This was the only thing she could think of. Lathea, please, I'm at my wit's end. I need help. She's given you a goodly sum, Sebastian put in. If you say that we have the wrong person and you don't want to help, then I guess we should save the gold for the right person. Lathea gave him a sly smile. Oh, I said she had the wrong person, but I didn't say I couldn't earn the payment tendered. I don't understand, Jensen said, holding her cloak closed at her throat as she shivered with cold. Lathea gazed out at her for a moment, as if waiting to be sure they were paying close attention. You are looking for my sister, Althea. I am Lathea. She is Althea. She is the one who helped you, not I. Your mother probably got our names mixed up or you recalled it wrong. It used to be a common mistake back when we were together. Althea and I have different talents with the gift. It was she who helped you and your mother, not I. Jensen was dumbfounded and disappointed, but at least not defeated. There was still a thread of hope. Please, Lathea, could you help me this time? In your sister's place? No, 
I can do nothing for you. I am blind to your kind. Only Althea can see the holes in the world. I cannot. Jensen didn't know what that meant, holes in the world. Blind to my kind? Yes, I have told you what I can. Now go away. The woman started pulling back from the door. Wait, please. Can you at least tell me where your sister lives then? She looked back at Jensen's expectant face. This is dangerous business. It's business, Sebastian said, his voice as cold as the night. A gold mark's worth. For that price, we should at the least have the place where we can find your sister. Lathea considered his words, then, in a voice as cold as his had been, said to Jensen, I don't want nothing to do with your kind. Understand? Nothing. If Althea does, that's her business. Inquire at the People's Palace. Jensen seemed to remember traveling to a woman not terribly far from the palace. She had thought it was Lathea, but it must have been her sister, Althea. But can't you tell me more than that? Where she lives? How I can find her? Last time I saw her, she lived near there with her husband. You can inquire there for the sorceress, Althea. People will know her, if she still lives. Sebastian put his hand against the door before the woman could shut it. That's a pretty thin bit of information. We should have more than that for the price offered. For what I have told you, the price is paltry. I gave you the information you need. If my sister wants to tempt her doom, that's up to her. What I don't need for any price is trouble. We mean no trouble, Jensen said. We only need the help of a spell. If you can't help with that, then we thank you for your sister's name. We will seek her out. But there are some important things I need to know. If you could tell me... If you had any decency, you'd leave Althea alone. Your kind will only bring us harm. Now go from my door before I set a nightmare upon you. Jensen stared at the face in the shadows. Someone already has, she said, as she turned away. Chapter 9 Oba, feeling fashionable in his cap and brown wool jacket, walked down the sides of the narrow streets, humming a tune he had heard played on a pipe at an inn he'd passed. He had to wait for a rider to go by before he turned down Lathea's road. The horse's ears swiveled toward him as it passed. Oba had had a horse once, and liked to ride, but his mother had decided that they couldn't afford to keep a horse. Oxen were more useful and did more work, but they weren't as companionable. As he walked down the dark road, his boots crunching on the crust of snow, a couple came past from the opposite direction, from the direction of Lathea's place. He wondered if they had gone to the sorceress for a cure. The woman cast a wary look his way. On a dark road, such a reaction was not undue, and, too, Oba knew that his size frightened some women. She sidestepped clear of him. The man with her met Oba's gaze. Many men didn't. The way they stared reminded Oba of the rat. He grinned at that memory, at learning new things. Both the man and the woman thought he was grinning at them. Oba tipped his cap to the lady. She returned a weak smile. It was the kind of empty smile Oba had often seen from women. It made him feel a buffoon. The couple melted into the dark streets. Oba stuffed his hands in his jacket pockets and turned back toward Lathea's place. He hated going there in the dark. The sorceress was fearsome enough without the walk down her dark path. He let out a troubled sigh into the brisk winter air. He wasn't afraid to confront the strength of men, but he knew he was helpless against the mysteries of magic. He knew how much misery her potions inflicted upon him. They burned him going in and coming out. They not only hurt, they made him lose control of himself, making him seem like he was just an animal. It was humiliating. He had heard tell of others, though, who had angered the sorceress and suffered worse fates. Fevers, blindness, a slow, lingering death. One man had gone mad and run off naked into a swamp. People said he must have crossed the sorceress somehow. They found him snake-bit and dead, all puffed up and purple, floating among the slimy weed. Oba couldn't imagine what the man had done to earn such a fate from the sorceress. He should have known better and been more cautious with the old shrew. Sometimes... Oba had nightmares about what she might do to him with her magic. He imagined Lathea's powers could lance him with a thousand cuts, or even strip the flesh from his bones, boil his eyes in his head, or make his tongue swell until he gagged and choked in a slow, agonizing death. He hurried along the path. The sooner started, the sooner finished. Oba had learned that. When he reached the house, he knocked. 
It's Oba Shalk. My mother sent me for her medicine. He watched his breath cloud in the air while he waited. The door finally opened a sliver so she could peer out at him. He thought that being a sorceress, she should be able to see him without having to open the door for a look first. Sometimes, when he was there waiting for Lathea to mix up medicine, someone would come and she would simply open the door. Whenever Oba came, though, she always peered out first to see it was him. Oba. Her voice was as sour with recognition as her expression. The door opened to admit him. Cautiously, respectfully, Oba stepped inside. He peered about even though he knew the place well. He was careful not to act too forward with her. Harboring no fear of him, she swatted his shoulder to spur him to move deeper into the room to give her the leeway to shut the door. Your mother's knees again? the sorceress asked, pushing the door closed against the frigid air. Oba nodded as he stared at the floor. She says they're aching her and she'd like some of your medicine. He knew he had to tell her the rest of it. She asked for you to... to send along something for me as well. Lothea smiled in that sly way she had. Something for you, Oba. Oba knew that she knew very well what he meant. There were only two cures he ever went to her for, one for his mother and the one for him. She liked to make him say it, though. Lothea was as mean as a toothache. A remedy for me, too, Mama said. Her face floated closer. She peered up at him, the snaky smile still playing across her features. A remedy for wickedness? Her voice came in a hiss. That it, Oba? Is that what Mother Shalk wanted you to fetch? He cleared his throat and nodded. He felt puny before her thin smile, so he looked back down at the floor. Lathea's gaze lingered on him. He wondered what was in that clever mind of hers, what devious thoughts, what grim schemes. She finally moved off to fetch the ingredients she kept in the tall cabinet. The rough pine door squeaked as she pulled it open. She set bottles in the crook of her other arm and carried them to the table in the middle of the room. She keeps trying, doesn't she, Oba? Her voice had gone flat like she was talking to herself. Keeps trying even though it never changes what is. Oba. An oil lamp on the trestle table lit the collection of bottles as she set them there, one at a time, her eyes lingering on each. She was thinking about something. Maybe what vile brew she might mix up for him this time. What sort of sickly condition she would inflict upon him in an attempt to purge him of his ever-present unspecified evil. The oak logs in the hearth had checkered in the wavering yellow-orange glow of the fire, throwing good heat as well as light into the room. In the middle of their room, Oba and his mother had a pit for a fire. He liked the way the smoke in Lathea's fireplace went right up the chimney and out of the house, rather than hanging in the room before eventually making its way out a small hole in the roof. Oba liked a proper fireplace, and thought that he should make one for him and his mother. Every time he went to Lathea's place, he studied the way her fireplace was built. It was important to learn things. He also kept an eye on Lathea's back as she poured liquid from bottles into a wide-mouthed jar. She mixed the concoction with a glass rod as each new ingredient was slowly added. When she was satisfied, she poured the medicine in a small bottle and stoppered it with a cork. She handed him the little bottle. For your mother. Oba passed her the coin her mother had given him. She watched his eyes as her knobby fingers slipped the coin into a pocket in her dress. Oba finally let his breath go after she turned back to her table, to her work. She lifted a few bottles, studying them in the light of the fire, before she began mixing his cure. His cursed cure. Oba didn't like speaking with Lathea, but her silence often made him even more uncomfortable, made him itch. He couldn't really think of anything worthy of saying, but he finally decided that he had to say something. Mama will be glad for the medicine. She's hoping it will help her knees. And she's hoping for something to cure her son. Oba shrugged, regretting his attempt at casual conversation. Yes, ma'am. The sorceress peered back over her shoulder. I've told Mother Shulk that I don't believe it will do any good. Oba didn't think so either, because he didn't really believe there was anything needing curing. When he had been little, he thought that his mother knew best and wouldn't give him the cure if he didn't need it. But he had since come to doubt that. She no longer seemed to him as smart as he had once believed her to be. She must care about me, though. She keeps trying. Maybe she's hoping that the cure might rid her of you. Lithia said almost absently as she worked. Oba. Oba's head came up. 
he stared at the sorceress's back. He had never considered such a thought. Maybe Lathea was hoping that the cure would rid them both of the bastard boy. His mother sometimes went to see Lathea. Maybe they had discussed it. Had he ignorantly believed the two women were trying to do good for him, to help him, when the opposite was actually true? Maybe both women had hatched a plan. Maybe they had been conniving all along to poison him. If something happened to him, his mother would no longer have to help support him. She often complained about how much he ate. Time and again she told him that she worked more to feed him than herself, and that because of him she could never put any money away. Maybe if she had instead put away the money she'd spent on his cures over the years, she'd have a comfortable nest egg by now. But if something happened to him, his mother would have to do all the work. Maybe both women just wanted to do it out of simple meanness. Maybe they hadn't thought it all through, as Oba would. His mother often surprised him with her simple-mindedness. Maybe both women had been sitting around one day and had just decided to be mean. Oba watched the flickering light play over the thin strands of the sorceress's straight hair. Today, Mama said that she should have done what you always told her to do from the beginning. Lathea, pouring thick brown liquid into the jar, glanced back over her shoulder again. Did she now? Oba. What did you say from the beginning that Mama should do? Isn't it obvious? Oba. Icy realization prickled his flesh. You mean that she should have killed me? He had never before come out and said anything so bold. He had never once in any way dared to confront the sorceress. He feared her too much. But this time, the words had just come into his mind, much like the voice did, and he had spoken them before he had time to consider whether or not it was wise to do so. He had surprised Lathea even more than he had surprised himself. She hesitated at her bottles, watching him as if he had changed before her very eyes. Maybe he had. He realized then that he liked the way it felt to speak his mind. He had never before seen Lathea falter. Maybe it was because she felt safe dancing around the subject, safe in the shadows of the words without having them brought out into the light of day. That what you always wanted her to do, Lathea? That it? Kill her bastard boy? A smile pushed its way onto her thin face. It wasn't like you make it sound, Olba. All the low, slow, haughty intonation had evaporated from her voice. Not at all. She addressed him more like a man than she ever had before, rather than an evil bastard boy she tolerated. She sounded almost sweet. Women are sometimes better off without a newborn babe. It isn't so bad when the babe is newborn. They're not such a... such a person yet. Oba, surrender. You mean, it would be easier? That's right, she said, eagerly latching on to his words. It would be easier. His own voice slowed and took on an edge that he didn't know had been in him. You mean it would be easier before they got big enough to fight back? The range of his latent talents amazed him. It was a night of new wonders. No, no, that's not at all what I mean. But he thought it was. Her voice, reflecting a fresh respect for him, quickened, became almost urgent. I only mean that it's easier before a woman comes to love her child. You know, before the child comes to be a person. A real person with a mind. It's easier then, and sometimes it's best for the mother. Oba was learning something new, but he hadn't put it all together yet. He sensed that all his new learning was profoundly important, that he was on the cusp of true understanding. How could it be best? Lathea stopped pouring the liquid and set the bottle down. Well, sometimes it's a hardship to have a new baby. A hardship on both. It's best for both, really, sometimes. She walked briskly to the cabinet. When she returned with a new bottle, she stepped around to the other side of the table so her back was no longer to him. Most of the ingredients for his cures were powders or liquids, and he didn't know what they were. The bottle she brought back contained one of the few things he recognized, the dried base of mountain fever roses. They looked like brown, shriveled little circles with stars in the centers. She often added one to his cure. This time she poured a pile in her cupped hand, made a fist to crush them, and dumped the fine brown crumbles in the cure she was mixing. Best for both, Oba asked. 
Her fingers seemed to be looking for something to do. Yes, sometimes. She seemed like she didn't want to talk about it anymore, but couldn't find a way to make it end. Sometimes it's more of a hardship than a woman can endure, that's all. A hardship that only endangers her and the rest of her children. But Mama had no other children. Lathea went silent for a moment. Oba, surrender. He listened to the voice, the voice that had become somehow different, somehow vastly more important. No, but all the same, you was a hardship on her. It's difficult for a woman to raise a child by herself, especially a child... She caught herself, then started over. I only meant that it would be hard. But she did it. I guess you were wrong, isn't that so, Lathea? You were wrong. Not Mama, you. Mama wanted me. And she never married, Lathea snapped. Her flash of anger had put the flame of haughty authority back in her eyes. Maybe if she... Maybe if she'd married, she would have had a chance to have a whole family instead of only... A bastard boy. Lathea didn't answer this time. She seemed to regret having taken a stand. The spark of anger left her eyes. With slightly trembling fingers, she dumped another pile of the dried flower buds in her palm, hurriedly crushed them in her fist, and dumped them in the cure. She turned and busied herself studying the flames in the hearth through a liquid in a blue glass bottle. Oba took a step toward the table. Her head came up, her eyes turning to his. Dear Creator, she whispered as she looked into his eyes. He realized she was not speaking to him, but to herself. Sometimes when I look into those blue eyes, I can see him. Oba's brow drew down above his glare. The bottle slipped from her hand, thumped on the table, and rolled to the floor where it shattered. Oba, surrender. Surrender your will. This was new. The voice had never before said that. Page 83. You wanted Mama to kill me, didn't you, Lathea? He took another step toward the table. Lathea stiffened. Stay where you are, Oba. There was fear in her eyes, little rat eyes. This was definitely new. He was learning new things almost faster than he could note them all. He saw her hands, the weapons of a sorceress, lifting. Oba paused. He stood cautiously at attention. Surrender, Oba, and you will be invincible. This was not merely new, it was startling. I think you want to kill me with your cures, don't you, Lathea? You want me dead. No, no, Oba, that isn't true. I swear it isn't. He took another step, testing what the voice promised. Her hands rose, a glow of light coming to life around her clawed fingers. The sorceress was conjuring magic. Oba, her voice was more forceful, more sure. Stay where you are, now. Surrender, Oba, and you will be invincible. Oba felt his thighs bump the table as he advanced. The jars rattled and clanked together. One of them wobbled. Lathea watched it teeter and almost right itself only to topple and spill its thick red liquid. Lathea's face abruptly twisted with hatred, with rage, with effort. She cast her clawed hands forward toward him, cast the full force of her power at him. With a thunderous clap, light ignited, the flash making everything in the room go white for an instant. He saw a flare of a yellow-white light knife through the air toward him, deadly lightning sent to kill. Oba felt nothing. Behind him, the light blasted a man-sized hole through the wooden wall, scattering flaming splinters out into the night. All the fire fizzled out in the snow. Oba touched his chest where the full force of her power had been directed. No blood, no torn flesh. He was unharmed. He thought that Lathea was even more surprised about it than he. Her mouth hung open in astonishment. Her wide eyes stared. All his life he had feared this scarecrow. Lathea quickly recovered, and again her face twisted with effort as she drew her hands up. This time an eerie blue hiss of light formed. The air smelled like burning hair. Lathea turned her palms up, sending forth her deadly magic, sending him death. Power no person could withstand shrieked toward him. The blue light scorched the walls behind, but again he felt nothing. Oba grinned. 
Again, Lethea wheeled her arms, but this time she also whispered a chant of clipped words he could not understand, rattling off a menace of magic. A column of light bloomed, undulating in the air before him, a viper of extraordinary might. Beyond doubt, it was meant to kill. Oba lifted his hands to feel the snaking rope of crackling death she had spawned. He ran his fingers through it, but could feel nothing. It was like looking at something in a different world. There, but not. It was as if he were invincible. With a howl of outrage, her hands came up again. Quick as thought, Oba seized her by the throat. Oba! she screeched. Oba, no! Please! This was new. He had never before heard Lathea say please. With her neck in his meaty grip, he dragged her across the table toward him. Bottles scattered, tumbling to the floor. Some thudded and rolled, some broke like eggs. Oba closed a fist on Lathea's stringy hair. She clawed at him desperately, calling upon her talents. She spoke words that had to be a mystical entreaty to magic, to her gift, to her sorceress power. While he didn't recognize the words, he understood their lethal intent. Oba had surrendered, though, and he had become invincible. He had watched her unleash her rage. Now he unleashed his. He slammed her up against her cabinet. Her mouth grew wide with a silent scream. Why did you want Mama to get rid of me? Her eyes, big and round, were fixed on the object of her terror. Oba. All his life she had delighted in terrifying others. Now all that terror had returned to haunt her. Why did you want Mama to get rid of me? A series of small panting cries were her only answer. Why? Why? Oba ripped her dress from her body. Coins spilled from the pocket, raining across the floor. Why? He clutched the white shift she wore underneath the dress. Why? She tried to hold the shift to herself, but he stripped it away, sending her tumbling across the floor, bony arms and legs sprawling. Her wasted breasts hung like shriveled udders. This powerful sorceress was now naked before him, and she was nothing. Her cries, full and round, came to life at last. Teeth gritted, he snatched her by the hair and hauled her to her feet. Oba rammed her against the cabinet. Wood splintered, bottles cascaded out. He seized a bottle as it rolled out and broke it against the cabinet. Why, Lafia? He brought the neck of a broken bottle up against her body. Why? She shrieked all the louder. He twisted it against her soft middle. Why? Please, oh dear creator, please, no. Why, Lathea? Because, she wailed, you are the bastard son of that monster, Dark and Rall. Oba hesitated. This was stunning news, if it was true. Mama was forced. She told me so. She said it was some man she didn't know who fathered me. Oh, she knew him, she did. She worked at the palace when she was younger. Your mother had big breasts and bigger ideas back then, poorly conceived ideas. She wasn't smart enough to realize that she was no more than a knight's diversion for a man with a limitless supply of women, those eager like her and those not. This was definitely something new. Dark and Rall had been the most powerful man in the world. Could that noble Rall blood flow in his veins? The heady implications made his head swim. If the sorceress was telling the truth. My mother would have stayed there at the people's palace if she carried Dark and Rall's son. You aren't his gifted heir. But still, if I was his son, despite her pain, she managed to give him that smile that said he was but dirt to her. You are not gifted. Your kind were vermin to him. He ruthlessly exterminated all he discovered. He would have tortured you and your mother to death if he knew of you. Once she learned this, your mother fled. Oba was overwhelmed with new things. They were beginning to become a jumble in his mind. He pulled the sorceress close. Dark and raw was a powerful wizard. If what you say is true, he would have hunted us. He slammed her against the cabinet again. He would have hunted me. He shook her to elicit an answer. He would have. He did. But he could not see the holes in the world. Her eyes were rolling. Her frail body was no match for Oba's strength. Blood ran from her right ear. What? Oba reasoned that Lathea was babbling nonsense now. Only Althea can... She had ceased to make sense. 
he wondered how much of what she had said was true. Her head lolled to the side. I should have saved us all when I had the chance. Althea was wrong. He shook her, trying to get her to say more. Red froth bubbled from her nose. Despite his yelling, his demanding, his shaking her, no more words came. He held her close, his heavy, hot breath lifting thin strands of her hair as he glared into her aimless eyes. He had learned all he would from her. He remembered all the burning powder he'd had to drink, the potions she had mixed for him, the days he'd spent in the pen. He remembered all the times he'd vomited his guts out, and it still wouldn't stop burning his insides. Oba growled as he lifted the bony woman. With a roar of anger, he slammed her against the wall. Her cries were fuel for the fire of his vengeance. He reveled in her helpless agony. He smashed her down against the heavy trestle table, breaking it and breaking her. With each crash, she became more limp, bloody, incoherent. But Oba had only just begun to rage at her. Chapter 10 Jensen didn't want to go back to the inn, but it was dark and cold, and she didn't know what else to do. It was disheartening that Lethea wouldn't answer their questions. Jensen had pinned her hopes on the woman's help. What shall we do tomorrow, Sebastian asked. Tomorrow? Well, do you still want me to help you leave Dahara, as you and your mother asked of me? She hadn't really thought it out. In view of what little Lethea had told her, Jensen wasn't sure what to do. She stared absently out into the empty night as they trudged across the crusted snow. If we went to the people's palace, I would have some answers, she said, thinking out loud, and hopefully Althea's help. Going to the people's palace was by far the most dangerous alternative, but no matter where she ran, where she hid, Lord Rawl's magic would haunt her. Althea might be able to help. Maybe, somehow, she would be able to conceal Jensen from him so she could have her own life. He seemed to give her words serious thought, a long cloud of his breath trailing away in the wind. We'll go to the people's palace, then. Find this Althea woman. She felt somehow uneasy when she realized that he wasn't offering any argument or trying to talk her out of it. The people's palace is the heart of Dahara. It's not just the heart of Dahara, but the home of the Lord Rahl. Then he wouldn't be likely to expect you to go there, would he? Expected or not, they would still be walking into the enemy's lair. No predator long neglected to notice the prey in his midst. They would be naked before his fangs. Jensen glanced over at the shadowed shape walking beside her. Sebastian, what are you doing in Dahara? You seem to have no love for the place. Why would you travel to a place you don't like? Beneath his hood, she saw his smile. Am I that obvious? Jensen shrugged. I've met travelers before. They talk about places they've been, sights they've seen, wonders, beautiful valleys, breathtaking mountains, fascinating cities. You don't speak of anywhere you've been or anything you've seen. You want the truth? he asked, his expression now serious. Jensen looked away. She suddenly felt awkward, nosy, especially in light of what she wasn't telling him. I'm sorry. I have no right to ask such a thing. Forget I mentioned it. I don't mind. He looked over at her with a wry smile. I don't think you would be one to report me to Daharan soldiers. She was appalled at the very idea. Of course not. Lord Rahl and his Daharan Empire wish to rule the world. I'm trying to help prevent that. I'm from south of Dahara, as I told you before. I was sent by our leader, the Emperor of the Old World, Jagang the Just. I am Emperor Jagang's strategist. Then you're someone of high authority, she whispered in astonishment. A man of high rank. The astonishment quickly transformed to tingling intimidation. She feared to guess at his importance, his rank. In her mind, it rose by the moment, notch by notch. How am I to address one such as you? As Sebastian. But you're an important man. I'm a nobody. Oh, you're somebody, Jensen Daggett. The Lord Rahl himself does not hunt nobodies. Jensen felt an odd and unexpected sense of uneasiness. She harbored no love for Dahara, of course, but she still felt somewhat uncomfortable to know that Sebastian was there to help bring about the defeat of her land. The twinge of loyalty confused her. After all, the Lord Rahl had sent the men who had murdered her mother. The Lord Rahl hunted Jensen, wanted her dead. But it was the Lord Rahl who wanted her dead, not necessarily the people of her land. 
The mountains, the rivers, the vast plains, the trees and plant life had always all sheltered and nurtured her. She'd never really thought it through in that way before, that she could love her homeland, yet hate those who ruled it. If this Jagang the Just succeeded, though, she would be freed from her pursuer. If Dahara was defeated, Lord Rao would be defeated. The rule of evil men would be ended. She would at last be free to live her own life. In light of how open he was with her, she also felt foolish, even ashamed, for not telling Sebastian who she was and why Lord Rahl hunted her. She didn't know it all herself, but she knew enough to know that Sebastian would share the same fate as she if they caught him with her. As she thought about it, it began to make sense why he might not object to going to the people's palace, why he might be willing to risk such a dangerous journey. As a strategist for the Emperor Jagang, perhaps Sebastian would like nothing better than to sneak a look into the enemy's lair. Here we are, he said. She looked up and saw the white clabbered face of the inn. A metal mug, hanging from a bracket overhead, squeaked as it swung to and fro in the wind. The sounds of singing and dancing spilled out onto the snow-covered silence of the night. With an arm around her shoulders, Sebastian sheltered her as they made their way through the great room, shielded her from the prying eyes, and led her to the stairs at the far side. If possible, the place was even more crowded and noisy than before. Without pause, the two of them quickly ascended the stairs. Partway down the dim hall, he unlocked a door to the right. Inside, Sebastian turned the wick up on the oil lamp sitting on a small table. Alongside the lamp was a pitcher and wash basin, and near the table, a bench. Looming to the side of the room sat a high bed, covered crookedly with a dark brown blanket. The room was better than the home she had left, but Jensen didn't like it. One wall was overlaid with drab painted linen. The plastered walls were stained and fly-blown. Since the room was on the second floor, the only way down was back through the inn. She hated the stink of the room, a sour mixture of pipe smoke and urine. The chamber pot beneath the bed hadn't been emptied. As Jensen pulled a few things from her pack and went to the table to wash her face, Sebastian left her to it and went back downstairs. By the time she had finished washing and had brushed her hair, he returned with two bowls of lamb stew. He had brown bread, too, and mugs of ale. They ate sitting close together on the short bench, hunched over the table, close to the wavering light of the oil lamp. The stew didn't taste as good as it looked. She picked out the chunks of meat, but left the colorless, tasteless, soft vegetables. She sopped up some of the juice with the hard bread. She gave her ale to Sebastian and drank water instead. She wasn't used to drinking ale. To her, the ale smelled as unpleasant as the lamp oil. Sebastian seemed to like it. When she had finished eating, Jensen paced in the confining room the way Betty paced in her pen. Sebastian threw a leg to each side of the bench and leaned back against the wall. His blue eyes followed her from the bed to the wall, hung with linen, and back again, as she began wearing a path in the plank floor. Why don't you lie down and get some sleep, he said in a soft voice. I'll watch over you. She felt like a trapped animal. She watched him take a long draft of ale from his mug. And what will we do tomorrow? It wasn't only her dislike of the inn, of the room. Her conscience was eating at her. She didn't let him answer. Sebastian, I have to tell you who I am. You were honest with me. I can't stay with you and endanger your mission. I don't know anything about the important things you do, but being with me will only put you at great risk. You've already helped me more than I could have hoped, more than I ever could have asked. Jensen, I'm already at risk being here. I am in the land of my enemy. And you're someone of high rank, an important man. She rubbed her hands together, trying to bring some warmth to her icy fingers. If they captured you because you were with me, well, I couldn't bear it. I took the risk of coming here. But I haven't been honest with you. I haven't lied to you, but I haven't told you what I should have long ago. You're too important a man to chance being with me when you don't even know why I'm hunted, or what that attack back at my house was about. She swallowed at the painful lump in her throat. Why my mother lost her life. He said nothing, but simply gave her the time to gather herself and tell him in her own way. From the first moment she had met him, and he hadn't come close when she had been afraid, he always gave her the room she needed in order to feel safe. He deserved more than she gave him in return. Jensen finally brought a halt to her pacing and looked down at him, at his blue eyes, blue eyes like hers, like her father's. Sebastian. 
Lord Rawl, the last Lord Rawl, Dark and Rawl, was my father. He took the news without any outward reaction. She couldn't know what he was thinking. As he gazed up at her, as calmly as he did when she wasn't telling him terrible news, she felt safe in his company. My mother worked at the People's Palace. She was part of the palace staff. Dark and Rawl, he noticed her. It is the Lord Rawl's prerogative to have any woman he wants. Jensen, you don't... She lifted a hand, silencing him. She wanted the whole thing out before she lost her nerve. Having always been with her mother, she feared being alone now. She feared he would abandon her, but she had to tell him what she knew. She was fourteen, Jensen said, beginning the story as calmly as she could. Too young to really understand about the ways of the world, of men. You saw how beautiful she was. At that young age, she was already pretty as could be, growing into a woman sooner than many her age. She had a bright smile and an innocent exuberance for life. She was a nobody, though, and to an extent excited to be noticed, desired by a man of such power, a man who could have any woman he wanted. That was foolish, of course, but at her age and station it was flattering, and in her innocence I suppose it might have even seemed glamorous. She was bathed and pampered by older women on the palace staff, her hair done up like a real lady, she was dressed in a beautiful gown for her meeting with the great man himself. When she was brought to him, he bowed and gently kissed the back of her hand. Her, a servant in his great palace, and he kissed her hand. From all accounts, he was so handsome that he shamed the finest marble statues. She had dinner with him in a great hall and ate rare and exotic foods she had never tasted before. Just the two of them at a long dining table, with people serving her for the first time in her life. He was charming. He complimented her on her beauty, her grace. He poured wine for her, the Lord Rawl himself. When she was at last alone with him, she was confronted with the reality of why she was there. She was too frightened to resist. Of course, had she not meekly submitted, he would have done what he wished anyway. Dark and Rawl was a powerful wizard. He was easily as cruel as he was charming. He could have handled any woman without the slightest difficulty. He had but to command it, and those who resisted his will were tortured to death. But she never gave any thought to resisting. For a brief time, despite her apprehension, that world at the center of such splendor, such power, had probably seemed exciting. When it turned to terror for her, she bore it silently. It wasn't rape in the meaning of being taken against her will with a knife held to her throat, but it was a crime nonetheless, a savage crime. Jensen looked away from Sebastian's blue eyes. He took my mother to his bed for a period of time before he tired of her and moved on to other women. There were as many women as he could want. Even at that age, my mother didn't hold any foolish illusion that she meant something to him. She knew he was simply taking what he wanted for as long as he wanted, and that when he was finished with her, she would soon be forgotten. She was doing as a servant did, a flattered servant, perhaps, but still a frightened, innocent young servant who knew better than to resist a man above any law but his own. She couldn't bear to look at Sebastian. In a small voice, she added the last bit to the tale. I was the result of that brief ordeal in her life, and the beginning of a far greater one. Jensen had never before told anyone the awful story, the terrible truth. She felt cold and dirty. She felt sick. Most of all, she felt deep anguish for what her mother must have gone through, for her young life spoiled. Her mother never told her the story all out as Jensen had just done. Jensen had pieced snippets and snatches of it together over her whole life until it was finally a whole picture in her mind. She wasn't telling Sebastian all the snippets either, the true extent of the horror of the way her mother had been treated by Dark and Rawl. Jensen felt burning shame that she had to be born to remind her mother every day of that terrible memory she could never tell in whole. When Jensen looked up through tears, Sebastian was standing close before her. His fingertips gently touched the side of her face. It was as tender a thing as she had ever felt. Jensen wiped the tears from under her eyes. The women and their children mean nothing to him. The Lord Rahl eliminates all those offspring who are not gifted. Since he takes many women, children of these couplings are not uncommon. He covets only one, his heir, the single child born of his seed who carries the gift. Richard Rawl, Sebastian said. Richard Rawl, she confirmed, my half-brother. Richard Rawl, her half-brother, 
who hunted her as his father before him had hunted her. Richard Rall, her half-brother, who sent the quads to kill her. Richard Rall, her half-brother, who had sent the quads that had murdered her mother. But why? She could have been no threat to Dark and Rall, and even less of a threat to the new Lord Rall. He was a powerful wizard who commanded armies, legions of the gifted, and countless other loyal supporters. And she? She was nothing but one lone woman who knew few people and wanted only to live her own simple life in peace. She was hardly a threat to his rule. Even the truth of her story would not so much as raise an eyebrow. Everyone knew that any Lord Rawl lived by his own laws. No one was even remotely likely to disbelieve her story, but no one would really care either. At most, they might wink or give one another a knowing elbow at the lives of powerful men, and Darken Rawl had been the most powerful man alive. Jensen's whole life seemed suddenly to come down to that central question. Why would her father, a man she never knew, have wanted so desperately to kill her? And why would his son, Richard Rawl, her own half-brother, and now the Lord Rawl, also be so intent on killing her? It made no sense. What could she possibly do that could harm either of them? What threat could she possibly constitute to such power? Jensen checked that the knife at her belt, her knife displaying the emblem of the House of Rawl, was secure. She lifted the blade to be sure it was free in its scabbard. The steel made a pleasing metallic click as she pushed it home. She scooped her cloak off the bed and threw it around her shoulders. Sebastian swiped a hand back across his white spikes of hair as he watched her quickly tie the cloak shut. What do you think you're doing? I'll be back in a while. I'm going out. He reached for his weapons and cloak. All right. I'll... No, leave me to it, Sebastian. You've put yourself at risk enough on my behalf. I wish to go alone. I'll be back when I've finished. Finished what? She hurried to the door. What I have to do. He stood in the center of the room, fists at his sides, apparently hesitant to go against her explicit wishes. Jensen quickly pulled the door shut tight behind herself, closing off her view of him. She took the steps two at a time, intent on being quickly out of the inn and gone before he changed his mind and followed. The crowd downstairs was as rowdy as they had been before. She ignored the men, their gambling, their dancing, their laughter, and headed for the door. Before she made it, though, a bearded man hooked his arm around her middle and jerked her back into the press of people. She let out a small cry that was lost in the gale of revelry. Her left arm was pinned against her waist. He swung her around, catching her right hand, dancing her across the floor. Jensen tried to reach up to pull back her hood to free her red hair in order to give him a scare, but she couldn't liberate her arm. He held her other hand in an iron grip, not only could she not free her hair, she couldn't reach her knife to defend herself. Her breath came in a frightened pant. The man laughed with his fellows and swirled her to the music, holding her tight lest he lose his dance with her. His eyes shone with merriment, not menace, but she knew that was only because she had not yet forcefully resisted. She knew that when he discovered that she was unwilling, his pleasant demeanor was sure to change. He released her waist and spun her around. With only one hand still entrapped in his calloused fingers, she hoped yet to break the hold. With her left hand, she fumbled for her knife, but it was under her cloak and not handy to her offhand. The crowd clapped in time with the tune of the pipes and drums. As she turned and stepped away, another man caught her up around the waist, bumping against her hard enough to knock the wind from her in a grunt. He captured her hand away from the first fellow, she had wasted her chance to pull back her hood by trying for her knife instead. She found herself adrift in a sea of men. The few other women, serving girls mostly, were either willing or laughed and were able to alight briefly and then move away, like bugs that were able to walk on water. Jensen didn't know how they performed the trick. She was in danger of drowning among waves of men who passed her along from one to another. When she caught sight of the door, she yanked away suddenly, breaking the hold of the latest man to have her in his grip. He hadn't been expecting her to suddenly break free. The men all laughed at the fellow who had lost hold of her. His merriment, as she had expected, died. The rest of the men were more good-natured about it than she had expected and sent up a cheer for her escape. Instead of showing anger, the man from whom she had escaped bowed. Thank you, my beautiful lass, for the gracious dance. It was a kindness to a lumbering old soul such as me. 
His grin returned, and he winked at her before turning back to clap along with his fellows in time to the music. Jensen stood stunned, realizing that it had not been the danger she had expected. The men were having a good time, and not really intent on harm. None had touched her in an unseemly manner, or even spoken any crude words to her. They had only smiled, laughed, and danced with her. Still, Jensen made a quick line for the door. Before she went out, another arm caught her around the waist. Jensen started to fight and pull away. I didn't know you liked to dance. It was Sebastian. She relaxed and let him usher her out of the inn. Out in the dark night, the cold air was a relief. She pulled a long breath, happy to be away from the unfamiliar smell of ale, pipe smoke, and sweaty men, happy to be away from the noise of so many people. I told you to leave me to it, she said. Leave you to what? I'm going to Lathea's place. Stay here, Sebastian, please. If you tell me why you don't want me to go. She lifted a hand, but let it flop back to her side. Sebastian, you're an important man. I feel terrible about the danger you've already been in, all because of me. This is my problem, not yours. My life is... I don't know. I don't have a life. You do. I don't want to get you all tangled up in my mess. She started out across the crusty snow. Just wait here. He stuffed his hands in his pockets as he strode along beside her. Jensen, I'm a grown man. Don't decide for me what I should be doing, all right? She didn't answer as she turned the corner down a deserted street. Tell me why you want to go see Lathea, will you? She stopped then at the side of the road close to an uninhabited building not far from the corner of the road that turned down to Lathea's place. Sebastian, my whole life I've been running. My mother spent the better part of her life running from Dark and Rawl, hiding me. She died running from his son, Richard Rawl. It was me Dark and Rawl was after. Me Dark and Rawl wanted to kill, and now it's Richard Rawl who is after me. Who wants to kill me? And I don't know why. I'm sick of it. My life is nothing but running, hiding, and being afraid. It's all I do. All I think about. That's all my life is. Running from a man trying to kill me. Trying to stay a step ahead of him. And stay alive. He didn't argue with her. So, why do you want to go to the sorceress? Jensen pushed her hands under her cloak, under her arms, to warm them. She gazed down toward the dark road to Lathea's place at the feathery canopy of bare branches moving in the wind. Some of the limbs creaked and groaned as they rubbed together. I even ran from Lathea earlier. I don't know why Lord Rawl is chasing me, but she does. I was afraid to insist she tell me. I was going to travel all the way to the People's Palace in order to find her sister Althea, hoping that maybe, as I stand meekly before her door, she might deign to tell me, to help me. What if she doesn't? What if she too dismisses me? Then what? What greater danger could there be than for me to go there to the People's Palace? And for what? The hollow hope that someone will finally volunteer to stoop to help a solitary woman hunted by the mighty force of a nation led by the murderous bastard son of a monster. Don't you see? If I would stop taking no for an answer and insist Lathea tell me, then maybe I could save a dangerous journey to the even more dangerous heart of Dahara and leave instead. For the first time in my life, I could be free then. But I was about to throw away that chance because I was afraid of Lathea too. I'm sick to death of being afraid. In the dim light, he stood considering their options. So let's just leave. Let me take you away from Dahara, if that's what you want. No. Not until I find out why Lord Rahl wants to kill me. Jensen, what difference does it make if... No! Her fists tightened. Not until I find out first why my mother had to die. She could feel bitter tears turning icy cold as they ran down her cheeks. Finally, Sebastian nodded. I understand. Let's go see Lathea. I'll help you get an answer from her. Maybe then you'll let me take you away from Dahara to where you will be safe. She brushed back the tears. Thank you, Sebastian. But don't you have some kind of job to do here? I can't let my problems get in your way any longer. This is my trouble. You must live your own life. He smiled then. Our people's spiritual guide, Brother Narev, says that our most important job in this life is helping those who need help. Such a sentiment lifted her spirits when she didn't think they could be lifted. He sounds like a wonderful man. He is. But you are still on a duty from your leader, Jagang the Just, aren't you? Brother Narev is also a close friend and spiritual guide to Emperor Jagang. Both men would want me to help you. I know they would. 
After all, the Lord Rahl is our enemy too. Lord Rahl has caused our people untold hardship. Both men, Brother Narav and Emperor Jagang, would insist I help you. That's the truth of it. She was choked with emotion and couldn't speak. She let him put his arm around her waist and lead her down the road. Sharing the quiet darkness with him, Jensen listened to the soft sound of their boots crunching through the hard crust of snow. Lathea had to help her. Jensen intended to see to it. Chapter 11 Oba hated it to end, but he knew it had to. He would have to get home. His mother would be angry if he stayed too long in town. Besides, he could wring no more enjoyment out of Lathea. She had given him all the satisfaction she was ever going to give him. It had been fascinating while it lasted, boundlessly fascinating, and he had learned many new things. Animals simply did not provide the same kind of sensations as those he had gotten from Lathea. True, watching a person die was in many ways much like watching an animal die, but at the same time it was oh so very different. Oba had learned that. Who knew what a rat was really thinking, or if rats could even think at all? But people could think. You could see their mind through their eyes, and you knew. To know they were thinking real people thoughts, not some chicken rabbit rat thoughts, behind those human eyes, behind that look that said it all, was intoxicating. Witnessing Lafia's ordeal had been rapture, especially as he waited for that singular inspirational instant of ultimate anguish when her soul fled her human form and the keeper of the dead received her into his eternal realm. Animals did give him a thrill, though, even if they lacked that human element. There was tremendous enjoyment to be had in nailing an animal to a fence or a barn wall and skinning them while they were still alive. But he didn't think they had a soul. They just died. Lathea had died, too. But it had been a whole new experience. Lathea had made him grin like he had never grinned before. Oba unscrewed the top of the lamp, pulled out the woven wick, and dribbled lamp oil across the floor over the broken pieces of the trestle table around Lathea's medicine cabinet lying face down in the center of the room. As much as he knew he would enjoy it, he couldn't just leave her there to be discovered. There would be questions, if she was found like this. He glanced over at her, especially if she was found like this. That idea did hold a certain fascination. He would enjoy listening to all the hysterical talk. He would love to hear people tell him all the macabre details of the monstrous death Lathea had suffered. The very idea of a man who could have taken the powerful sorceress out in such a grisly fashion would cause a sensation. People would want to know who had done it. To some folk, he would be an avenging hero. People everywhere would be abuzz. As word spread about Lathea's ordeal and gruesome end, the gossip would heat to a fever pitch. That would be fun. As he emptied the last of the lamp oil, he saw his knife where he'd left it beside the overturned cabinet. He tossed the empty lamp on the heap of ruin and bent to retrieve his knife. It was a mess. Couldn't have an omelet without breaking eggs, his mother always said. She said it a lot. In this case, Oba thought her tired old saw fit. With one hand, he took Lathea's favorite chair and tossed it into the center of the room, then began carefully cleaning his blade on the quilted throw from the chair. His knife was a valuable tool, and he kept it razor sharp. He was relieved to see the shine returning when the blood and slop was wiped off. He'd heard that magic could be troublesome in untold ways. Oba had briefly worried that the sorceress might be made up of some kind of dreadful acid sorceress blood that once spilled would eat through steel. He looked around. No, nope, just regular blood, lots of it. Yes, the sensation this would create would be exciting. But he didn't like the idea of soldiers coming around to ask questions. They were a suspicious lot, soldiers. They would poke their noses into it, sure as cows gave milk. They would spoil everything with their suspicion and questions. He didn't think that soldiers appreciated omelets. No, best if Lathea's house burned down. That wouldn't provide nearly the enjoyment that all the conversation and scandal would, but it also wouldn't be so suspicious. People's houses burned down all the time, especially in winter. Logs rolled out of fireplaces, spilling flaming coals. Sparks shot into curtains and set homes ablaze. Candles melted down and fell, catching things on fire. Happened all the time. Not really suspicious, a fire in the dead of winter. With all the lightning and sparks the sorceress sent flying willy-nilly, 
It was a wonder the place hadn't already burned down. The woman was a menace. Of course, someone might notice the blaze way down at the end of the road, but by then it would be too late. By then the fire would be too hot for anyone to be able to come near the place. Tomorrow, if no one found the place ablaze, there would be nothing but ashes. He let out a sad sigh for the stillborn gossip, for what might have been, if not for the tragic fire that would be blamed for Lafia's end. Oban knew about fires. Over the years, several of his homes had burned down. Their animals had been burned alive. That was back when they had lived in other towns, before they moved to the place where they lived now. Oba liked to watch a place burn, liked to hear the animals scream. He liked it when people came running all in a panic. They always seemed puny in the face of what he created. People were afraid when there was a fire. The uproar caused by a burning building always swelled him with a sense of power. Sometimes, as they yelled for more help, men would throw buckets of water on the fire or beat at the roaring flames with blankets, but that never stopped a fire Oba had started. He wasn't slipshod. He always did good work. He knew what he was doing. Finally finished cleaning and polishing his knife, he threw the bloody quilted throw on the oil-soaked wood beside the overturned cabinet. What was left of Lethea was nailed to the back of the cabinet that lay face down on the floor. She stared at the ceiling. Oba grinned. Soon there would be no ceiling for her to stare up at. His grin widened, and no eyes to stare with. Oba saw a glint of light on the floor beside the cabinet. He bent and recovered the small object. It was a gold coin. Oba had never seen a gold mark before that night. It must have fallen from the pocket of Lethea's dress along with the others. He slipped the gold coin into his own pocket, where he'd put the rest he had collected from the floor. He'd also found a fat purse under her sleeping pallet. Lathea had made him rich. Who knew that the sorceress had been so wealthy? Some of that money earned by his mother from her spinning and used for his hated cures had at last returned to Oba. Justice finally done. As Oba started for the fireplace, he heard the soft but unmistakable crunch of footsteps in the snow outside. He froze in mid-stride. The footsteps were coming closer. They were approaching the door to Lathea's house. Who would be coming to Lathea's place this late at night? That was just plain inconsiderate. Couldn't they wait until morning for their cures? Couldn't they let the poor woman get her rest? Some people only thought of themselves. Oba snatched up the poker leaning against the fireplace and quickly spilled the burning oak logs out of the hearth and across the oil-soaked floor. The oil, the splintered wood, the bedsheets, and the quilted throw caught fire with a whoosh. Dense white smoke swirled up around Lathea's pyre. Quick as a fox, Oba scurried out the hole that the troublesome sorceress had conveniently blown through the back wall when she had tried to kill him with her magic. She didn't know that he had become invincible. Jensen was pulled up short when Sebastian caught her by the arm. She turned to see his face in the dim light coming from the only window. That orange glow danced in his eyes. She knew immediately by his serious expression that she should remain silent. Sebastian noiselessly drew his sword as he slipped past her on his way to the door. In that smooth, practiced movement, she saw a professional, a man familiar with such business. He leaned to the side, trying for a look through the window without having to step into the deep snow below it. He turned back and whispered, Fire! Jensen rushed to him. Hurry! She might be asleep! We have to warn her! Sebastian considered for only an instant, then burst through the door. Jensen was right on his heels. She had difficulty making sense of what she saw inside. The place was washed in whirling orange light that cast monstrous shadows up the walls. In that wavering light, everything seemed surreal, out of scale and out of place. When she spotted the debris in the center of the room, it became only too real. She saw a woman's open hand sticking out beyond the top of what looked to be a tall wooden cabinet that had fallen. Jensen drew a choking gasp of smoke and the smell of lamp oil. Thinking that maybe the cabinet had toppled and hurt the old sorceress, Jensen rushed to help. As she raced around the foot of the splintered chest, she caught the full view of what was left of Lathea. The shock of it stiffened her. She couldn't move, couldn't blink her wide eyes. She gagged on the sickly stench of butchery and blood. As Jensen stared, her anguished cry was lost in the leaping roar of flames and crackle of burning wood. 
Sebastian briefly took in the remains of Lethea, nailed to the back of the cabinet, only one detail of many as his gaze scanned the room. By his calculated movements, she surmised that he had seen such things enough that the human element no longer arrested his attention as it did hers. Jensen. Jensen's fingers tightened around the hilt of her knife. She could feel the ornately worked ridges of metal pressing against her palm, the worked metal peaks and whorls that made up the letter R. As she gasped her breath past the nausea welling up inside, she pulled the blade free. Surrender. They've been here, she whispered. The Daharan soldiers have been here. What she detected in his eyes was more like surprise or confusion than anything else. He frowned as he glanced around again. Do you really think so? Jensen. She ignored the echo of the dead voice in her head and thought back to the man they had met out on the road after they had come to see the sorceress the first time. He was big, blonde, and good-looking, like most Taharan soldiers. She hadn't thought at the time that he was a soldier. Could he have been one, though? No, if anything, he had seemed more intimidated by them than they were of him. Soldiers didn't behave the way that man had. Who else? We didn't see all of them before. It had to be the rest of the quad from back at my house. When we escaped out the back way, they must have somehow followed us. He was still peering about as the flames grew, now licking at the ceiling. I guess you could be right. Surrender. Sebastian, we have to get out of here now, or we'll be next. Jensen clutched the cloak at his shoulder, pulling him away. They may be near right now. But how could they know? Dear spirits, Lord Rawl is a wizard. How does he do anything he does? How did he find my house? Sebastian was still looking, prodding at the rubble with his sword. Jensen tugged again at his cloak, urging him toward the open door. Your house, he said, frowning. Yes, I see what you mean. We have to get out of here before they catch us. He nodded, reassuring her. Where do you want to go? They both watched the dark doorway over their shoulders, as well as the growing conflagration to their other side. We've no choice now, Jensen said. Lathea was our only hope to find an answer. We have to go to the People's Palace now. Find her sister, Althea. She's the only one with any answers. She's a sorceress, too, and the only one who can see the holes in the world, whatever that means. Are you sure that's what you want to do? She thought about the voice. It sounded so cold and lifeless in her head. It had surprised her. She hadn't heard it since her mother's murder. What other choice do we have now? If I'm ever to know why Lord Rawl wants to kill me, why he murdered my mother, why I'm hunted, and maybe how to escape his clutches for good, then I have to go find this woman, Althea. I have to. He hurried with her through the door and out into the bitter night. We better go back and get our things together. We can get an early start. With them this close, I fear to be trapped in the inn while we sleep. I have the money for my mother. You have what you took from the men. We can buy horses. We have to leave tonight and hope that no one saw us come here earlier or again now. Sebastian sheathed his sword. His breath streamed out into the night as he considered their options. He glanced back through the door. With the fire, at least there won't be any evidence of what happened here. We have that much going for us. No one saw us come here earlier, so no one will have cause to ask us questions. No one will know we were here again. They won't have any reason to tell soldiers about us. As long as we get out of here before it's discovered and everyone gets suspicious, Jensen said. Before soldiers start asking about strangers in town. He took her arm. All right, let's be quick then. Chapter 12 Well, wasn't this just something? Stranger and stranger. This night was full of new things, one right after another. From his hiding place just around the corner of the house, Oba had been able to hear much of the conversation between the two. At first, he had been sure they would run off to get help. Oba didn't think the fire could be extinguished, but for a time he had been concerned, fearing that the man and woman might pull Athea out of the house, rescue her from the blaze so that people could have a look. It would be just like the troublesome sorceress to find a way to come back to torment him, and after all, his work. But both the man and the woman wanted to leave Lathea to the fire. They, too, hoped the fire would cover the evidence of the sorceress's true end. They almost sounded like thieves, the woman talking about taking money from her mother and him taking money from men. That sounded suspicious. If they had found gold and silver there, they might have taken it. 
had they worked and slaved their whole lives as he had to finally recover money that was their due? Or had they been forced to suffer the abuse of swallowing Lathea's cursed cures their whole life? Ulva didn't think so. It had been different for him. He had simply recovered money that was rightfully his all along. He felt a little indignant to be almost in the company of common thieves. This night was just one startling thing after another. It seemed amazing to him how his life had gone along day after day, month after month, year after year, always the same. Same chores, same work, same everything. Now, in one night, all that seemed to have changed. First, he had become invincible, and in so doing unleashed his righteous inner self, only to discover that raw blood coursed through his veins, and now this odd pair showed up to help him conceal Athea's true end. Stranger and stranger. The startling news that he was, in fact, the son of Dark and Rawl still had him in a state of astonished shock. He, Oba Shulk, as it turned out, was someone quite important, someone of noble blood, someone of noble birth. He wondered whether or not he should now properly think of himself as Oba Rawl. He wondered if he was, in fact, a prince. That was an intriguing notion. Unfortunately, his mother had raised him simply, so he didn't know much about such matters what station or title was rightfully his. He also realized that his mother was a liar. She had hidden his true identity from her own son, her flesh and blood, Dark and Rawl's flesh and blood. She was probably resentful and envious and didn't want Oba to know of his greatness. That would be just like her. She was always trying to beat him down. The bitch. The smoke coming through the open door no longer smelled of lamp oil. It now carried the aroma of roasting meat. Oba grinned as he peeked through the doorway to see Lathea's hand sticking above the cabinet, blackening in the flames, waving to him from the world of the dead. Sneaking across the snow to hide behind the fat trunk of an oak, Oba watched as the couple hurried down the path through the trees toward the road. When they had passed out of sight, he followed in their tracks, staying hidden. He was a pretty big man to hide behind a tree, but in the darkness it wasn't difficult. He was puzzled and troubled by certain aspects of the encounter. He had been surprised that the couple wouldn't want to call for help and instead ran away. The woman especially was eager to escape, thinking that because of Lathea's death, someone was after them. A quad, she had said. That was part of what troubled him. Oba had vaguely heard of quads before, assassins of some sort, assassins sent by the Lord Rawl himself, assassins sent after important people, or people who were especially dangerous. Maybe that was it. They were dangerous people and not common thieves after all. Oba had heard her name, Jensen. But the thing that had really perked up his ears was that Lathea had a sister named Althea, yet another cursed sorceress, and Althea was the only one who could see the holes in the world. That was most troubling of all, because that was the very same thing that Lathea had said to him. At the time, he had thought the old sorceress was already conversing with the spirits in the world of the dead, or maybe with the keeper of the underworld himself, but as it turned out, she was speaking the truth. Somehow this Jensen woman and Oba were both what Lithia called holes in the world. That sounded important. This Jensen was somehow like him. They were somehow connected. That fascinated him. He wished he had gotten a better look at her. The first meeting had been in darkness. The second time he saw her, just now, the fire had provided only enough light for a dim and shadowed view. As she had turned away, he only had time for a quick glimpse. From that fleeting look, he'd seen that she was a remarkably beautiful young woman. He paused behind a tree before making his way across the open snow toward the concealment of a more distant tree. These people, like Jensen, like Oba, who were holes in the world, were important. Quads were sent after important people people who were especially dangerous to the Lord Rawl. Lathea had said that if he knew of Oba, the Lord Rawl would want to exterminate him. Oba didn't know if he believed Lathea. She would be jealous of anyone more important than herself. Still, he might be in some kind of danger without even knowing it, hunted because he was an important man. That seemed pretty far-fetched. But in view of all the other new things he had learned this night, he didn't think it was entirely out of the question. An important man, a man interested in learning new things, didn't just dismiss such new information without giving it due consideration. Oba was still trying to connect together all the things he had learned. 
It was all very complicated, that much he did know. He had to take everything into account if he was to put it all together. As he scurried to the next tree, he decided that it might be best if he went to the inn and got a better look at Jensen and Sebastian, the man with her. His eyes tracked them as they reached the road that headed back into town. Even though the couple kept looking around, it wasn't difficult in such darkness for Oba to follow them without being seen. Once they were back among the buildings, it was even easier. From around the corner of one building, Oba saw the light spill out into the road when they opened the door below a metal mug swinging in the wind. Laughter and music spilled out too, like a celebration of the sorceress's demise. Too bad everyone didn't know that Oba was the hero who had done away with the bane of all their lives. If people knew what he had managed to accomplish, he would probably have all the free drinks he could want. He watched as Jensen and Sebastian were swallowed inside. The door thudded shut. The stillness of the winter night returned. Oba never got a chance to go to an inn for a drink. He never had any money. He had money now. He had had a hard night, but he had emerged a new man, a rich man. Wiping his nose on his jacket sleeve, he made for the door. It was time for him to go to a cozy inn and have a drink. If anyone deserved one, it was Oba Rall. Jensen suspiciously scanned the faces at the inn, looking for any that might betray murderous design. She still felt sick from the sight of what had been done to Lithia. This night there were monsters about. Men looked her way, but the twinkle in their eyes seemed merry, not murderous. But how would she know before it was too late? She ached to take the stairs two at a time. Easy, Sebastian whispered, apparently believing she was on the verge of panicked flight. Maybe she was. His grip on her arm tightened. Let's not make people suspicious. They took the stairs one at a time, moving at a measured pace, just a couple going to their room. In their room, Jensen burst into motion, gathering the few items they had removed from their packs, replacing them, securing the straps and buckles. Even Sebastian, checking his weapons beneath his cloak, seemed unnerved by what had happened to Lithia. Jensen made sure that her knife was free in its scabbard. You sure you wouldn't like to get some sleep? Lithia couldn't have told them anything. She didn't know we were staying here at the inn. It might be better to start fresh at dawn. She shot him a look as she shouldered her pack. Right, he said. He caught her arm. Jensen, slow down. If you run, people will want to know why you're running. He was in enemy territory. He would know how to go about the business of not raising suspicion. Jensen nodded. What should I do? Just act like we're going down for a drink or to listen to the music. If you insist on going directly out, walk. Don't call attention to us by running. Maybe we're just going to visit a friend or relative. Who's to say? But we don't want people to wonder if there's something wrong. People forget normal. They remember when things look wrong. Unabashed, she nodded again. I guess I'm not very good at this. Close-up running, I mean. I've been running and hiding my whole life, but not like this. When they're so close, I can almost feel their breath on my neck. He smiled that warm smile of his, the one that looked so good on him. You aren't trained in this kind of thing. I wouldn't expect you to know how to act. Even so, I don't think I've ever met another woman who was as good as you are under such pressure. You're doing fine. You really are. Jensen felt a little better to know that she wasn't acting like a complete fool. He had a way about him that gave her confidence, put her at ease, made her able to do things she didn't think she could. He let her decide on her own what it was she wanted to do, and then he backed up her decision. Not many men would do that for a woman. Down the steps once again, for the last time, she could feel the door on the other side of the room, as if she were drowning, and it was the only air. People so close, brushing against her, still made her uneasy, made her feel the desperate need for that air. She had learned earlier, though, that the men weren't the threat she had thought. She was somewhat humbled by how wrong she had been about them. Where before she had seen thieves and cutthroats, she now saw farmers, craftsmen, laborers joining together for company, companionship, and some harmless recreation. Still, there were killers somewhere close this night. After seeing Lithia, there could be no doubt of that. Jensen could never have imagined that anyone could be that perverted. She knew that if they caught her, they would eventually do those kinds of things to her too before she was allowed to die. She felt her stomach royal with nausea at the vivid memory of what she had seen. She held back her tears, but
but she needed the air of outdoors and the solitude of the night. As she and Sebastian wound their way through the crowd and toward that air, she bumped into a big man as they crossed paths. Stopped by the human wall, she looked up into the handsome face. She remembered him. He was the man they had seen on the road to Lathea's place earlier. He lifted his cap in greeting. Evening. He grinned at her. Good evening, she said. She told herself to smile and make it believable, normal. She wasn't sure if she was doing a good job of it, but he seemed to find it convincing. He didn't act as shy as she thought he had seemed before. Even the way he carried himself, his movements were more sure. Maybe it was just that her smile was working as she had hoped. You two look like you could use a drink. When Jensen frowned, not knowing what the man meant, he gestured at her face and then at Sebastian. Your noses are red with the cold. May I buy you an ale on this chill night? Before Sebastian could accept, which she feared he might, she said, Thank you, no, we have to go to check on some business. But it was very kind of you to offer. She made herself smile again. Thank you. The way the man stared at her made her nervous. The thing was, she found herself staring back into his blue eyes just as intently, and she didn't know why. Finally, she broke the gaze, and after a bow of her head to bid the big man a good night, made her way toward the door. Something about him looked familiar, she whispered to Sebastian. Yes, we saw him earlier, out on the streets, when we were on our way to Lathea's house. She looked back over her shoulder, peering between the milling throng. I guess maybe that's all it is, then. Before she went out the door, the man, as if he sensed her looking at him, turned. When their eyes met and he smiled, it was as if no one else existed for either of them. His smile was polite, no more but it made her go cold and tingly all over the way the dead voice in her head sometimes did. There was something frightening familiar about the feeling she got looking at him and the way he looked at her. Something about the look in his eyes reminded her of the voice. It was as if she remembered him from a deep dream she had completely forgotten until that very instant. The sight of him in her awake life left her shaken. She was relieved to make it out into the empty night and be on their way. She bundled her cloak's hood close around her face against the bitter wind as they hurried across the snow and down the street. Her thighs stung with the cold. She was glad the stable was not far, but she knew that would be only a brief respite. It was going to be a long, cold night, but there was no choice. Lord Rawls' men were too close. They had to run. While Sebastian went to rouse the stableman, Jensen squeezed through the barn door. A lantern hanging from a beam provided enough light for her to make her way to the pen where Betty was tied up for the night. The shelter from the wind, along with the warm bodies of the horses and the sweet smell of hay and dusty wood, made the stable a cozy haven. Betty bleated plaintively when she saw Jensen, as if she feared she had been abandoned for all time. Betty's upright tail was a happy blur as Jensen sank to one knee and hugged the goat's neck. Jensen stood and stroked her hand along the silken ears, a touch Betty mooned over. As the horse in the next stall put her head over the rail to watch her stablemate, Betty stood on her hind legs, joyful to be reunited with her lifelong friend and eager to be closer. Jensen patted the wiry hair on Betty's fat middle. There's a good girl, she urged the lovable goat down. Glad to see you too, Betty. Jensen at ten had been there for Betty's birth and had named her. Betty had been Jensen's only childhood friend and had listened patiently to any number of worries and fears. When her short horns first began to come in, Betty had in turn rubbed and comforted her head against her faithful friend. Other than her worry of being abandoned by her lifelong companion, Betty's fears in life were few. Jensen groped through her pack until her fingers located a carrot for the ever-hungry goat. Betty danced about as she watched, then with her tail wagging in excitement, accepted the treat. For reassurance after the torment of an unusual separation, she rubbed the top of her head against Jensen's thigh while chewing the carrot. The horse in the next stall, her bright, intelligent eyes watching, neighed softly and tossed her head. Jensen smiled and gave the horse a carrot along with a rub on her white blaze. Jensen heard the jangle of tack as Sebastian returned, along with the stableman, both carrying saddles. Each man in turn laid his load over the rail of Betty's stall. Betty, still wary of Sebastian, backed a few steps. "'Sorry to lose the company of your friend there,' the man said, indicating the goat as he came up beside Sebastian. Jensen scratched Betty's ears. "'I appreciate her care.' "'Not much care. The night isn't over.' 
The man's gaze shifted from Sebastian to Jensen. Why do you two want to leave in the night anyway? And why do you want to buy horses, especially at this hour? Jensen froze in panic. She hadn't expected to have anyone question her, and so she had no answer prepared. It's my mother, Sebastian said in a confidential tone. He let out a convincing sigh. We just got word that she's taken ill. They don't know if she'll last until we can get there. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't... Well, we'll just have to make it in time, that's all. The man's suspicious expression softened with sympathy. Jensen was surprised at how credible Sebastian sounded. She tried to imitate his look of concern. I understand, son. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. What can I do to help? Which two horses can you sell us? Sebastian asked. The man scratched his whiskered chin. You going to leave the goat? Sebastian said yes. At the same time, Jensen said no. The man's big, dark eyes looked from one to the other. Betty won't slow us down, Jensen said. She can keep up. We'll make it to your mother just the same. Sebastian leaned a hip against the rail. I guess the goat will be leaving with us. With a sigh of disappointment, the man gestured to the horse Jensen was scratching behind the ear. Rusty here gets on well with that goat of yours. I guess she'd be as good to sell as any of the others. You're a tall girl, so she would fit you well. Jensen nodded her agreement. Betty, as if she had understood every word, bleated hers. I have a strong chestnut gelding that would better carry your weight, he said to Sebastian. Pete's down the way there on the right. I'd be willing to let you have him along with Rusty here. Why is she called Rusty? Jensen asked. Dark as it is in here, you can't see so well, but she's a red roan, about as red as they come, all except that white blaze on her forehead. Rusty sniffed Betty. Betty licked Rusty's muzzle. The horse snorted softly in response. Rusty it is, Sebastian said. And the other then. The stableman scratched his stubble again and nodded to seal the agreement. I'll go get Pete. When they returned, Jensen was pleased to see Pete nuzzle a greeting against Rusty's shoulder. With danger close on their heels, the last thing she wanted to have to worry about was handling bickering horses, but these two were friendly enough. The two men hurried at their work. A mother lay dying, after all. Riding with a blanket on her lap promised to be a welcome relief from traveling on foot. A horse would help keep her warm and make the night ahead more tolerable. They had a long rope for Betty who tended to get distracted by things along the way, edible things especially. Jensen didn't know what Sebastian had to pay for the horses and tack, nor did she care. It was money that had come from her mother's killers and would get them away. Getting away was all that mattered. With a wave to the stableman, as he held the big door open for them, they rode out into the frigid night. Both horses, apparently pleased at the prospect of activity despite the hour, stepped briskly along the street. Rusty turned her head back, making sure that Betty, at their left, was keeping up. It wasn't long before they passed the last building on their way out of town. Thin clouds raced before the rising moon, but left enough light to turn the snow-covered road to a silk ribbon between the thick darkness of the woods along each side. Betty's rope suddenly jerked tight. Jensen looked over her shoulder, expecting to see the goat trying to nibble at a young branch. Instead, Betty, her legs stiff, had her hooves dug in, resisting any progress. Betty, Jensen whispered harshly, come on, what's wrong with you? Come on. The goat's weight was no match for the horse, so she was dragged down the snowy road against her will. When Sebastian's horse stepped over, jostling Rusty, Jensen saw the trouble. They were overtaking a man walking down the road. In his dark clothing, they hadn't seen him at the right side against the dark of the trees. Knowing that horses didn't like surprises, Jensen patted Rusty's neck to assure her that the man wasn't anything to be frightened of. Betty, though, remained unconvinced and used all the rope available to swing a wide arc. Jensen saw then that it was the big blonde man from the inn, the man who had offered to buy them a drink, the man she thought for some reason should dwell only in her dream life rather than in her waking life. Jensen kept an eye on the man as they passed him. As cold as she was, it felt as if a door opened into the infinitely colder eternal night of the underworld. Sebastian and the stranger exchanged a brief greeting in passing. Once beyond the man, Betty scampered ahead, pulling at a rope, eager to put distance between her and the man. Krush deva, du kalt misht. Jensen, her breath caught fast at the end of a gasp, turned to stare wide-eyed at the man walking down the road behind. It sounded like it had been he who'd spoken the words. 
that was impossible. Those were the strange words from inside her head. Sebastian made no notice of it, so she didn't say anything lest he think her crazy. With Betty's agreement, Jensen urged her horse to pick up the pace. Just before they rounded a bend and were away, Jensen looked back one last time. In the moonlight, she saw the man grinning at her. Chapter 13 Oba was throwing a hay bale down from the loft when he heard his mother's voice. Oba, where are you? Get down here! Oba scurried down the ladder. He brushed hay from himself as he straightened before her waiting scowl. What is it, Mama? Where's my medicine and your cure? Her glare swept across the floor. I see you still haven't gotten the mess out of the barn. I didn't hear you come home last night. What took you so long? Look at that stanchion rail. Haven't you fixed that yet? What have you been doing all this time? Do I have to tell you every little thing? Oba wasn't sure which question he was supposed to answer first. She always did that to him, confused him before he could answer her. When he faltered, she would then insult and ridicule him. After all he had learned the night before, and all that had happened, he thought that he might feel more confident when he faced his mother. In the light of day, standing back in the barn with his mother gathered before him like a thunderhead, he felt much the same as he always did before her storming onslaught, ashamed, small, worthless. He had felt big when he came home, important. Now he felt as if he were shrinking. Her words shriveled him. Well, I was... You was dawdling! That's what you were doing, dawdling! Here I am waiting for my medicine, my knees aching me, and my son, Oba the Oaf, is kicking a rock down the road, forgetting what I sent him for. I didn't forget. Then where's my medicine? Where is it? Mama, I didn't get it. I knew it. I knew you were spending the money I gave you. I worked my fingers to the bone at spending to earn that, and you go wasting it on women. Whoring! That's what you was doing. Whoring! No, Mama, I didn't waste it on women. Then where's my medicine? Why didn't you get it like I told you to? I couldn't, because... You mean you wouldn't, you worthless oaf. You only had to go to Lathea's. Lathea is dead. There. He'd said it. It was out, and in the light of day. His mother's mouth hung open, but no words rained out. He had never seen her go silent like that before, seen her so shocked that her jaw just hung. He liked it. Oba fished a coin from his pocket, one he had set aside to return so she wouldn't think he'd spent her money. Amid the drama of such a rare silence, he handed her the coin. Dead? Lathea? She stared at the coin in her palm. What do you mean, dead? She went ill? Oba shook his head, feeling his confidence build as he thought about what he had done to Lathea, how he'd handled the troublesome sorceress. No, Mama, her house burned down. She was killed in the fire. Her house burned? His mother's brow drew together. How do you know she died? Lathea isn't likely to be caught unawares by a fire. The woman is a sorceress. Oba shrugged. Well, all I know is that when I went to town, I heard a ruckus. People were running toward her house. We all found the place ablaze. A big crowd gathered around, but the fire was so hot that there was no chance of saving the place. That last part was, to a degree, true. He had started to leave town, headed home because he figured that if no one had spotted the fire, maybe they wouldn't until morning. He didn't want to be the one to start yelling, fire. In light of history, that might look suspicious, especially to his mother. She was a suspicious woman, one of her many peevish traits. Oba had planned on simply telling his mother the story of what he knew was bound to happen anyway, the blazing ruins, the charred body found. But as he had been walking home after his visit to the inn, not long after that Jensen woman and the man with her, Sebastian, passed by, leaving town on their journey to find Althea, he heard people yelling that there was a fire down at Lathea's place. Oba ran down the long, dark road with the rest of the people toward the orange glow off in the trees. He was just a bystander, same as everyone else. There was no reason to suspect him of anything. Maybe Lathea escaped the flames. His mother sounded more like she was trying to convince herself than him. Oba shook his head. I stayed, hoping the same as you, Mama. I knew you'd want me to help her if she was hurt. I stayed to do what I could. That's why I was so late. That, too, was partly true. He had stayed, along with the crowd, watching the fire, listening to the talk. He had savored the crowd's anticipation, the gossip, the speculation. She's a sorceress! Fire isn't likely to catch such a woman! His mother was starting to sound suspicious. 
Oba had figured on this. He leaned a little toward her. When the fire burned out enough, some of us men threw snow down so we could get in over the smoking rubble. Inside, we found Lathea's bones. Oba pulled a blackened finger bone from his pocket. He held it out, offering it to his mother. She stared down at the grim evidence, but folded her arms without taking it. Pleased with the effect it had, Oba finally returned the treasure to his pocket. She was in the middle of the room with one hand lifted above her head, like she had tried to make it to the door but was overcome by the smoke. The men said that a fire's smoke was what put folks down, and then the fire got at them. That must have been what happened to Lathea. The smoke got her. Then, laying there on the floor, reaching toward the door, the fire burned her to death. His mother glared at him, her mean little mouth all pinched up but silent. For once, she had no words. He found her glare, though, was just as bad. In the daggers of that glare, he could tell that she was thinking he was no good, her bastard boy. Darken Rawl's bastard son, almost royalty. Her arms slipped from their sullen knot as she turned away. I have to get back to my spinning for Mr. Tuchman. You get this mess scooped off the floor, you hear? I will, Mama. And you had better get that stanchion fixed before I come back and see that you've been loafing away the day. For several days, Oba worked at the frozen muck on the floor, but made little headway. The weather had stayed bitterly cold, so the frozen mound, if anything, had only hardened. His efforts at wearing it down seemed interminable, like trying to chip away granite ledge, or his mother's stony disposition. He had his other chores, of course, and he couldn't let them go. He had fixed the stanchion and a broken hinge on the barn door. The animals had to be attended to, along with a hundred other small things. In his head, as he worked, he planned the construction of their fireplace. He would use the back wall between the house and barn, since it was already existing. Mentally, he stacked stones against it, creating the shape of the firebox. He already had his eye on a long stone to use for the lintel. He would mortar everything altogether properly. When Oba set his mind to doing something, he put his all into it. He didn't do any job he started just halfway. In his mind's eye, he pictured how surprised and happy his mother would be when she saw what he'd built them. She would recognize his worth then. She would finally acknowledge his value. But he had other work to do before he could begin to build a fireplace. One job in particular loomed before him. The surface of the mound of frozen muck in the barn showed the scars of the battle. It was now pocked with holes, places where he had been able to find a weakness, a place with air or dry straw underneath that had allowed him to break out a chunk. Each time a piece went pop and came loose, he was sure that he had at last found a way into the formidable tomb of ice, but each time had been a false hope. Chipping away with the scoop shovel was slow going, but Oba was no quitter. The worry had come to him that perhaps a man of his importance should not be wasting his time on such menial labor. Frozen manure hardly seemed the province of a man who was in all likelihood something akin to a prince. At the least, he now knew he was an important man. A man with raw blood in his veins. A direct descendant, the son of the man who had ruled Dahara Dark and Rawl. There probably wasn't a single person who had not heard of Dark and Rawl, Oba's father. Sooner or later, he would confront his mother with the truth she had been keeping from him, the truth of the man he really was. He just couldn't figure how to do it without her discovering that Lithia had spilled the news before she spilled her blood. Winded from a particularly spirited attack on the frozen mound, Oba rested his forearms on the shovel's handle while he caught his breath. Despite the cold, sweat trickled down from his matted blonde hair. Oba the oaf, said his mother as she strode into the barn. Standing around, doing nothing, thinking nothing, worth nothing. That's you, isn't it, Oba the Oaf? She glided to a stop, her mean little mouth all puckered up as she peered down her nose at him. Mama, I was just catching my breath. He pointed around at the chips of ice littering the floor, evidence of his strenuous efforts. I've been working at it, Mama, I have. She didn't look. She was glaring at him. He waited, knowing she had something more on her mind than the mound of frozen muck. He always knew when she was on a mission to trouble him, to make him feel like the muck he stood in. From the dark crevices and hidey holes around the barn, the rats watched with their little black rat eyes. With her critical gaze locked on him, his mother held out a coin. 
she held it between her thumb and first finger, not simply to convey the coin itself, but its importance.